get down to business. It's an international collision course. I'm going hard. Bellator champion Sergio Pettis defends his strap. Sergio Pettis! Against Japanese superstar Kyoji Typhoon Horiguchi. Horiguchi offensive strikes. In a battle that will take the world by storm. I'm back in my lane. I'm going hard. Bellator MMA Live tonight on Showtime, where warriors rule. Bellator MMA rings in the holiday season with its final event of 2021. Bellator 272 comes to you from Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut. And the evening will culminate with a highly anticipated battle for the Bellator MMA Bantamweight Championship. Sergio Pettis defeated Juan Archuleta to mine gold in his last outing, but he will defend against a man who never lost the Bellator Bantamweight belt inside the cage, Kyoji Horaguchi, back to reclaim what he never lost. He's a two-time rising champion, but it's all about Bantamweight gold in Bellator MMA in the main event of Bellator 272. The rest of the main card coming up at 10 Eastern on Showtime. Pivotal matchup at Featherweight. Two-time title challenger, number four ranked Emmanuel Sanchez meets the number nine ranked Canadian Jeremy Kennedy at Bantamweight, Josh Hill. He checks in at number seven. He takes on Jared Scoggins, who missed weight by a lot. And Johnny Eblen looks to remain undefeated when he welcomes Colin Hotbody to the Bellator MMA cage for the first time. That's Bellator 272 main card coming up on Showtime, but kicking off the prelims right here, right now. It's action at welterweight. Number 10 ranked Oliver Encamp, 3-0 in Bellator. He takes on Kyle Crutchmer, who is 3-1 in the Bellator cage. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome tonight's first fighter to the cage, Kyle Crutchmer. Twenty-eight-year-old Kyle Crutchmer. He is seven and one overall, coming off a hard-fought victory over Levan Chokley at Bellator 260 in June. John and he said that, well, of course, happy to get the victory. And it was all about this, his wrestling. It was all about his wrestling. Look, we know he's a two-time All-American wrestler at Oklahoma State. But when it came to being in the Bellator cage, started to be very happy with his hands, liked to try to get the knockout. He went back to his base, went back to being a smart fighter, used his wrestling against a guy who was 9-0 with nine knockouts and got the win, and that means he was a smart fighter. The Oklahoma State alum in his opponent will see what the Oklahoma State football team will see tomorrow. That's Baylor. And now, his opponent, Oliver Encamp. Number 10 ranked welterweight in Bellator MMA, Oliver Encamp, who for the first time spent part of his training camp in Sin City, Las Vegas at Syndicate MMA. He's on a three-fight winning streak and, uh, well, pulled off a impressive Submission win over Emmanuel Dawa in his last outing at Bellator 248 in October, John. Something called a Japanese necktie. Thank you very much. Look at Oliver Encamp has really grown into his body. He's a young guy that when he first came into MMA, all kinds of techniques, but sometimes got out of position. It's those techniques that he's starting to land now, and he's getting all of these types of big-time wins. Beautiful spinning back fist for the win, and then this fight in Paris, Japanese necktie. He gets that thing cranked on. That hurts the neck. A beautiful submission win for Mr. Encamp, and he is on the rise. The Karate Kid, Kyoji Oraguchi, will challenge for Bellator Bantamweight Gold in the main event. This Karate Kid, Oliver Encamp, he wants to be the best around, 
He wants to continue climbing up the rankings. He'll try to get by Kyle Crutchmer tonight. And you can see, look at that reach, 76.5 to 68. End camp is very long. Crutchmer must use his wrestling if he wants a win here tonight. With the official introductions, here is the voice of Bellator MMA, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Mohegan Sun Arena. As we get set now for Bellator 272, the prelims kick off now with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 5'9", weighing in 171 pounds, his professional record, seven wins, one loss from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Cuyahoga Kutchman. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 170 pounds even as a professional. Ten victories, two defeats from Stockholm, Sweden, presenting Oliver Enkamp. In charge, your referee, John English. Crutchmer bounced back from his uh, loss in his Blue, you prior go. Bellator Red, outing with a victory Round over on, Levan Chokli and Oliver Enkamp, a family of black belts in karate, former member of the Swedish karate national team before starting MMA and using those karate as kicks early, John. He is using it. If you're looking for Oliver Enkamp, just he mimics the fighting style of a Stephen Thompson. He comes from that family of martial artists, but Oliver Enkamp on the ground is outstanding also. So Kyle Crutchman has got to pick his poison, but he does need, in my opinion, to get this fight to the ground and work through the submission attempts and do damage on the ground. Crutchman changes levels, looking for the takedown. Had landed a right hand and now will try to maximize position, controlling the legs of Enkamp. Beautiful job of lacing the legs. Look at the figure four by Kyle Crutchmer. That is keeping those legs up off of the ground. That means that Oliver Enkamp, until he gets those legs free, cannot get himself up. Habib Nurmagomedov's influence knows no bounds. Well, it's an AKA type of technique anymore. They all use it. He put it on the real map with his dominance as the lightweight champion. And here you have Again, another. Right back. right back to it. That's exactly what Kyle Crusher does. Get him to turn his back, go to his back, and just start damaging him from the beginning. Wear him down. Don't worry about the big knockout shot. Just put volume on him when you're in close. Another takedown secured by Crutchmer. He said he needed to out-wrestle and camp, needed to be on top. Don't stray from what got him to the dance. And as you mentioned, John, he wrestled at Oklahoma State, a two-time All-American, two-time Big 12 champion, looking to grind and camp out with his wrestling. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And it, you could tell by the conditioning of Kyle Crutchmer. He came into this knowing he was going to have to wrestle a lot, use that wrestling, and he needed to be in shape for it. You see right now, Encamp going for the Kimura grip on the arm. He needs to really separate that. That's why his leg is up in between, trying to separate that arm from the body. He does not have that. Crutchmer was able to stop that. And right now, Crutchmer's in a position, once he protects his arm, he needs to come up on top and start opening up with some ground and pound to do damage. And Camp with six submission wins, three rear naked chokes, a triangle choke, inverted triangle choke, and the Japanese neck dive. See, and this is what I was talking about, you know, a la Steven Thompson. They're very similar on the feet, but on the ground, Oliver Encamp creates a lot of positional problems. Now going for an inverted triangle. Encamp credits his success to getting into the flow state and being able to adapt to every situation. Now, he's got the, the, the legs in the position of the triangle with the figure four, but he does not have the arm across, so right now, Kyle is not in trouble as far as it being a submission hole. Crunchburg was defeated by Cameron Lachinov at Bellator 249 via disputed decision. Never been stopped and now continues to control in camp along the fence. Under two minutes left here in the opening round. Uppercut underneath, a couple of uppercuts underneath by Enkem. This is a beautiful grinding style by Kyle Crutchmer right now. He is continuing to put relentless pressure on Enkem, not allowing him any space, not allowing him to circle out. 
bringing him right back. Once he gets to his feet, right back to the ground. That's demoralizing after a while. Beautiful job so far by Kyle Crutchmer with his wrestling. Less than 90 seconds left in the first round. Crutchmer controlling with his wrestling, putting all of his weight on Oliver Encamp, looking to tax Encamp's fuel tank early here in round one. All of the pressure, but Encamp staying on his feet, still continuing to fish for control. Again, taking him back down the ground. The one thing that Kyle needs to do that I'm seeing, you're seeing that Oliver Encamp is still continuing to strike at times. Crutchmer needs to fit in some elbow strikes or some punches to show the judges I'm not only controlling the position, I'm doing damage. Crutchmer, four for four in the takedown department. 40 seconds left in the first round. And Kemp has been stapled against that fence for a large portion of this opening round due to the wrestling credentials of Crutchmer. Five takedowns in all by Crutchmer. Then that is exactly what he Pulling. needs for this. He's looking for that knee bar. He does not have it right now. Bar, yeah, no space, and now eats an elbow. That's what I'm talking about from Crutchmer. In those situations, that's the strike that's going to tell the judges, yes, you're doing damage. And Cap continues to fish for a submission hammer fist from the bottom, staying active from the bottom, but it was Crutchmer's wrestling that dominated the opening round. No doubt about it. That was a very good round for Kyle Crutchmer as far as the wrestling, being able to take Oliver Incamp off of his feet continuously. But you saw Incamp landing strikes. But overall, that is Kyle Crutchmer's round, 10-9. Now let's surprise him. You got to let your hands go a little bit. Keep working on that neck. Yep. All right. I know it's kind of This is the story of the round right here. Dropping levels, getting into the legs gets the takedown and was very successful in using a leg lace, figure fouring those legs. You see right here, Encamp going for that Kimura grip. Crutchmer being Check able to fight up. through it. Check and then Encamp went into the inverted triangle position. He had Let's it go, twice in this round, but it was not close to being a submission. Searches for the knee bar, rolls into it. Crutchmer crushes it down, figure fours his leg, and then watch the big elbow right, right at the end. Takes it, he lands the big elbow strike right there. That's what he needs to do in the next round. Great round two. Both Oliver and Camp and Kyle Crutchmer looking to break out. Crutchmer would love to crash the top 10 rankings. And Camp currently sits at number 10. Side kick from the karate stance. That kick was caught by Crutchmer on those three right hands, setting up the takedown. That was a beautiful right hand that landed flush. That rocked Oliver and Camp pushing it back. And right now, Kyle Crutchmer is back to what he did so successfully in the first round. Again, lacing the legs, neutralizing Encamp. And Encamp, though, able to quickly get back to his feet, but expending energy here, trying to defend the wrestling attack of Kyle Crutchmer. And of course, it's incumbent on Crutchmer to maximize this dominant position. Yeah, well, right now, Encamp is looking, he's going for a switch on that, but with his ankle being picked by Crutchmer, that's not going to get him anywhere. Crutchmer is just relentlessly driving him into that cage, putting pressure, making it very heavy for Oliver Enkamp to try to stand. Many talked about it being that classic striker versus grappler contest, although in the 21st century, nice. it's all about the mixed martial arts. Nice knees from Enkamp. Nice knees inside by Enkamp. Crutchmer got stuck with his head down in the waist area. And going Enkamp for going for again. the Kimura, looking for the first Kimura submission of his career. He has six submission wins, so more than half of his 10 wins have come due to his submission skills. If he can get that arm out, Crutchmer is in deep trouble right now. He's got the figure four on that upper body. The arm's not across, so the choke's not happening, but he is in a position where he's trying to... And Crutchmer slams and cap down to the canvas hard. Well, what he's trying to do is put pressure so he can push his arm against Encamp and keep it from slipping out. Encamp still with the Kamara. 
Crutchmer pops his head out. Three minutes left in the second round. Crutchmer's never been submitted, but facing adversity here against Oliver Enkamp. And Enkamp talking about morphing into a complete fighter, John. You see evidence of it here. We, we talk about his karate background, a family affair, but this guy is dangerous on the ground. Crutchmer dangerous with the right hand. Crutchmer right now in a good position to land shots, but this is what I was talking about. This is what makes Oliver so difficult to deal with, is stand-up, very Steven Wonderboy Thompson-like, and then his ground game, as far as the submissions, he goes after him, and he's good with him, so he's dangerous in those positions. Well, it shouldn't surprise you that Encamp became interested in mixed martial arts when he became familiar with none other than Lyoto the Dragon Machida, another karate cop with amazing success, as Crutchmer now secures the neck of Encamp, but nothing doing there as he quickly is back in top position here, but side control. Oliver Enkamp was looking for a duck under, even though he was on his back. We would call it a duck under from the standing position. Kyle just put a stop on that, grabbed the neck, and put him back to his having his back on the canvas. Yeah, and Enkamp had that knee card that kept Crutchmer from going to side control. But from the open guard, Crutchmer again continues to smother Enkamp. Enkamp with active hips, though, John, but unable to, to reverse. Very much so. And what you're seeing, in camp is he's moving into lateral positions what Crutchmer needs to do is square his hips up at times he's allowing in camp's hips to get away from him he needs to square those hips up and keep him squared on the ground that way he can do damage with his strike and of course Crutchmer has to avoid whatever the modern day version of lay and pray is against a guy like Encamp. Well, he's not, laying, hook he's not laying at all because Encamp's not allowing him to. He is working very hard throughout this and trying to land shots when he can. Changes levels again and is able to keep Encamp along the fence. And then, John, it's seven of nine in terms of takedowns. That's the story. How do you score the takedowns? That's another story. Well, no, you're scoring these takedowns because those are working. It's keeping Encamp in the position that Crutchmer wants the fight to be. You can see Encamp doesn't want this on the ground. For the most part, he wants it standing, and he can't bring it there. And some people will say it's Encamp that's actually going for the finish, trying all of the submission attempts while Crutchmer is just keeping Encamp neutralized. Well, they're right. Encamp is the one going for the submission attempts, and Crutchmer is the one that's using his wrestling to control position and try to land strikes to do damage. The great teacher, that is Big John McCarthy, and you're right. It's in these these kinds of positions where you begin to really break down and see the nuances of this sport, John. Well, everybody thinks it's easy to do ground and pound. It's not. There is a science to it. There's a technique to it. And there are guys that are just outstanding at it. And there's guys that are not. But right now, Kyle Crutchmer is doing everything that he should be doing. Well, right now, NCAP has been wearing Crutchmer like an ugly Christmas sweater through two rounds here at Bellator 272. Let's go. Hey, when you're throwing, you're landing on the That was nice. That was nice. Hey, that right hand is there. The right hand's there. Give me right. Take a look at this. This is when he had the Kimura grip, and you see it is so tight that Kyle actually rolls through it to try to get himself out of that danger point. End cap locks up the figure four, and Kyle slams him down to try to break free of the Kimura grip and the inverted triangle. Bellator MMA car girl Louise joining us here tonight at the Mohegan Sun Arena. As we are about to Good. kiss 2020 good goodbye. Round, final Bellator MMA event of the year, and this is the final round of our opening contest on the prelims between the number 10 ranked welterweight Oliver Enkamp in the red gloves, who just ate that nasty kick by Kyle Crutchmer in the blue gloves, and it has been Kyle Crutchmer's wrestling that has dictated this fight.
No doubt about it, the wrestling has been the difference maker for Kyle Crutchburn. You can tell he's a little bit tired right now. He's just taking his time trying to get his air back, get his heart rate down. He had the full minute. He's just taking a little bit more. We're going to see when he decides to try to get that shot in, that little step, trying to push Encamp back, telling him, oh, it's going to come. I'm just not going to show you when. Encamp hoping to cash in on his kicking expertise. Right now I have Kyle Crutchmer up two rounds and nothing. So Oliver Encamp has got to do something to either be a, have a big round or finish this fight. And he ends up against the fence again with Kyle Crutchmer putting the squeeze on him. Encamp with some elbows. And if you're Crutchmer, you can't ask for a better situation. He gets the takedown without using much energy based upon Oliver falling. Crutchmer found his way to AKA in San Jose thanks to another Oklahoma State standout by the name of Daniel Cormier. And he has sparred with the likes of the one and only Habib Nurmagomedov. Well, he learned something from him because he keeps going back to that leg lace, which is a great technique and something that Khabib was the master of. Now, Encamp giving up his back, and for Crutchmer, if you're in his corner, what are you instructing him to do from this position? No, you're just instructing want him, him to do you want him just to keep him there like this? No, you're wanting him to put pressure and make him open up, and when you can get your hand free, I want you to start to strike with it. If it's short strikes, let's go to elbows. If it's uppercuts, do that. But putting him onto his butt is exactly the position that's going to keep you from having to deal with all the techniques that Oliver Encamp is so good with. To paraphrase Guns N' Roses, Crutchmer is taking Mr. Encamp down to Takedown City, 11 of 13. Right hook. You're right here, this is the type of position that Kyle Crutchmer can start to look for the Darce chokes and things like that if he wants to go for the submission, but he's doing so well with putting Oliver on his butt and using his wrestling with the takedowns. He's just going right back to what, look at, I don't blame him. This is what has made him successful in the fight so far. Grutchmer continues to crush space, suffocating Oliver Encamp's attempts at any kind of offense. Again, Encamp gives up his back, back up to a base, hand is still on the canvas. Knee as well. Encamp was looking towards rolling for that knee bar again. Now he's got the switch position is what he's looking for. But as long as Crutchmer is on that ankle, he's not going to be able to get himself away. Crutchmer's now got that hand up to the to the knee area, which sucks that leg right back down, and putting Oliver back on his butt. Well, Crutchmer said he wasn't going to stray away from what he's best at, and he certainly stuck to that game plan. He has secured 12 takedowns, 15 attempts. Coming up on the final minute and a half of this welterweight matchup to begin Bellator 272 at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut. And Camp keeps looking for that switch position. Kyle Crutchmer is just on top of it, saying it's not going to happen. I understand. I know what I'm doing and crushing that. He's looking to sweep that leg back out, control the leg. Now that he, you see Encamp getting his leg free, sucks it back up. Just an outstanding job of using the skill set that brought him to this sport in an effective fashion to make it to where his opponent can't hurt him, Moral. Final 45 seconds of the fight. Encamp's offense has been enervated by the wrestling pedigree of Kyle Crutchmer. Again, Ed Camp looking towards that, rolling for that knee bar, tries to sit out. Crutchmer just stuffing all of it now inside control position. Scramble by Ed Camp. Final 20 seconds. And headlock position. Submission attempt by the wrestler Crutchmer. And again, it's Ed Camp trying to. Toss up the Hail Mary in the form of a submission from his back, but time is going to run out. Coach John Smith at OSU has to be happy with Crutchmer's wrestling. Absolutely. Stand up, guys. Right now, John Smith's going, that's my man.
Two men who forged respect in what was 15 minutes of grueling, grinding action. And for Oliver Enkamp, who was 3-0 and here in Bellator, with all three of his fights ending in the first round, he was taken to the limit and then some by Kyle Crutchmer. Yeah, you got to look at what Kyle Crutchmer did and the way he was able to control the position, control what Oliver Enkamp was in any way able to try. He just was smothered throughout the fight. When you got a guy as dangerous in the stand-up with a lot of flying techniques like Enkamp, I go with Kyle Crutchmer being a very smart fighter. Here's the level change in the first round, going into the legs, and this happened repeatedly throughout the fight. You take a look at how many takedowns 13 total takedowns by Kyle Crutchmer in this fight. That takes a lot of energy, a lot of gas, and he was still going at the end of the fight, so he was absolutely in shape and ready to perform like a grinding wrestler would want to. Take a look at that. 24 strikes landed by Encamp, 28 by Kyle Crutchmer, but the big difference, look at the takedowns. 13 takedowns compared to zero. And that's the story of the fight. We are awaiting the official decision as Michael C. Williams makes his way back into the Bellator MMA cage. Oliver Enkamp and Kyle Crutchmer go the 15-minute distance in our welterweight opener here at Bellator 272. Let's find out who won. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Pete Rogers, Dave Torelli, Dave Hagen, all seen exactly the same 30 to 27 for the winner by unanimous decision, Kyle Crutchmer. AKA is an assembly line of A-level mixed martial arts talent and Kyle Crutchmer with a victory over number 10 ranked Oliver Enkamp. He's going to be moving on up like George and Wheezy. Let's say hello to Amanda Guerra at the fight desk. Hello, Maura. What a way to get the night started here. Yes, Amanda Guerra, along with two-time world champ Josh Thompson. What a night we have tonight. Sergio Pettis, Kyoji Horiguchi, the Bantamweight belt on the line. We're going to talk a lot about that. we got to talk about our co-main event tonight. Emmanuel Sanchez going up against Jeremy Kennedy. And you and I were talking about it. This has the chance to be explosive because Stylistically, these guys are pretty different. They're like Emmanuel Sanchez is somebody who is going to push the pace, but he's comfortable on his back to the point where he sometimes gets too comfortable there and will let the fight slip away. But he has learned from his last fight, and I think he's going to bring the pressure this whole fight. Now with Jeremy Kennedy, he is someone that does very good work from the top position, but it all comes from his wrestling and his takedowns. If you look at them together, they are phenomenal fighters. Both of them are top ranked, and both of them in the top ten. Both of them are going to bring pressure tonight and have a good fight. Both of them told us they're looking to make a statement in this fight. Both learning lessons from that last fight there. Let's see what our guy across the pond has to say about all that. Here's more from Gareth A. Davies. Two ambitious leading featherweights collide tonight as Emmanuel Sanchez takes on Jeremy Kennedy. Former world title challenger Sanchez battling a two-fight skid with defeats to Patricio Pitbull and Mads Burnell will look to get his timing and tenacity on point tonight to maintain his position high up on the featherweight ladder. And how the Matador combines his striking and his scrambling is likely to influence the outcome of the battle. Canadian Kennedy, meanwhile, a rounded veteran, suffered a decision loss himself last time out against Adam Borish and will be keen to regain his momentum and climb back up the rankings. It's all about ambition for Kennedy and delivering with masterful momentum in this closely matched fight with the man from Milwaukee. As we close the year, both fighters will be looking to steal the show. Take it away, gentlemen, and let us see the best of your beautiful brutality. All right, looking forward to the co-feature later tonight at Bellator 272. And hey, looking forward to this contract weight, 160 pound matchup. Dan Moret takes on Spike Carlisle. Carlisle making his Bellator MMA debut on short notice.
And now set to make his way to the cage spike, the crucifixion car line. And now making his way, Dan, the Hitman, the Rats. Well, Dan, the Hitman, Moret made uh, quite the entrance to Bellator MMA as he, well, was able to knock off the then number three ranked, now number four ranked. Lightweight Goichi Yamauchi, although it was via disputed split decision. Look, it was a tough fight for both of them, but it was Dan Moret that ended up getting the win, and he deserved it based upon the effort that he put out and coming in in a, in a tough situation and putting on a very good performance. Dan Moret has really grown in the last couple of years, took some time off. He is always in shape, and he's always in your face. You look at this, 35 years of age for Dan Moret, 28 for Spike Carlo. Does the young man get it, or does the old man show him how it's done? Here's MC Dub. For those joining us tonight, streaming the fights live from Bellator on YouTube and Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you inside Mohegan Sun Arena as we go now to three five-minute rounds at a contract weight. 160 pounds. Introducing the blue corner first at five foot eight, weighing in 159 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he enters with 12 professional victories, three losses, fighting out of Del Mar, California. Spike the Crucifixion. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 159.6 pounds. As a professional, 15 victories, six defeats. By way of Mankato, Minnesota, he fights out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Dan, the hitman, Moretz. In charge of referee, John English. Dan Moret has won back-to-back -back bouts. Carlisle in his Bellator MMA debut, he's proven to be Ray, tough as teak one, thus far in his career. The bell in round one scheduled for three again at a contract weight of 160 pounds. That's because Carlisle took the fight on short notice and, well, will want to take the fight to Dan Moret. After all, did not have a full training camp, John. You expect him to probably try to come out and maybe blitz Tamaret the way the Crusaders did back hey, well, in the day. It may not prove to be the wisest strategy, though, no, against no, a guy no, like Moret. I'm telling you right now, Dan Moret, very high fight IQ. He's a smart guy. Oh, they crash into each other. It's good wrestling position for Dan Moret. He loves being in the clinch here. Drives Carlisle to the cage. Carlisle very strong, and he's got very good judo, so you sometimes you're going to see him. He's going to switch his hips and go for hip tosses. He's quick with his movement. 
but Dameron very, very educated in the clinch game and how he goes about just breaking his opponent down. Moret began wrestling at the age of five, wrestled through high school. Minnick gone here in the first frame as Carlisle trying to control Dameron. Moret putting all the pressure on Carlisle along the fence, trying to change levels, but with the Overhook, underhook by Carlisle. That's going to be easier said than done. Well, it's easier said than done, but Moret's doing a very good job of using his head as a third arm and positioning. Take a look at where the position of Carlisle's head. Moret on the exit, and they nice. slowly, and Moret to Southpaw, and loading on Carlisle. Beautiful straight left by Dan, and that and low kick. And kick by Moret, and now Carlisle comes back with a right hand. This is the type of fight we expected with these two, and there goes Spike Carlisle getting the takedown. Spike's a little bit high, needs to set his hips back, relax, slow this down a little bit. <laughs> two minutes gone, and uh, furious exchanges between Moret and Carlisle. Well, both guys landed really nice, clean shots in that. The low calf kick that Dan Moret starts to employ, he needs to go back to that if he gets himself out of this position. Waste lock break. by Carlisle trying to bring Moret to the canvas. Moret, meanwhile, trying to break the grip. Yeah, he's trying to, trying to break the hands apart. He oh, wasn't able to do it. Warning. And a steady diet of right hands from Carlisle looking to get his hooks in. Carlisle's getting to the back, but backdoor escape by Moret. And he stacks Carlisle. Nice job of stepping over the leg by Dan Moret to control the position and keep Spike Carlisle down. He was getting up. That little step over that you saw him do, that kept Carlisle down. Now Dan Moret's just going to try to put a lot of pressure on him. Everything's slowing down a little bit, but these guys are going after each other. Moret said that he has more ways to win the fight, and he expects this fight to end with a knockout in the first round. He definitely uh, appeared to be going for that, although now he's going for a guillotine. He's going for that guillotine choker with the fence there. That could create a lot of pressure. Spike needs to be very careful. Carlisle keeping his hands on that it. leg. That's not a good position to have your hands. Seven of Moret's 15 wins have been via submission, including a guillotine choke, but Carlisle, blood now as well on the body of Carlisle as Moret continues to go for the submission. Moret's going for that submission. He keeps driving him back, but Carlisle's out of it. Nice knee to the body by Dan Moret. Resiliency by Carlisle coming forward. The soap pop, a little unsteady on his legs, that front kick. Fishing for range. Carlisle's got to grab some air. He was getting the, you know, there was a lot of pressure on that choke, even though it didn't put him out. Southpaw. Not breathing, normal. Southpaw versus Southpaw. Calf kick by Carlisle. Final 60 seconds of what has been a frenetic first round. One in which Dan Moret has had the advantage of Moret landing that left cross as Carlisle crushing space, but then just swinging wildly. Yeah. Oh, that's a kick by Moret. Spike Carlisle in that position. How good is his gas tank? He did take this fight with little notice. Exactly, and he has been put through the paces here by Dan the Hitman. Moret under 30 seconds left in the opening round. Carlisle, a BJJ brown belt, a judo black belt. He went for the elbow that just missed there. Looks for the takedown. And Moret looks for the guillotine. Going back to the guillotine. That's on tight. He's got eight seconds to survive. He's put a lot of pressure on it. Spike's okay. Spike Carlisle avoids going to the guillotine, at least in the first round. But it's a good thing if you are Dan Moret that, look at you're putting your opponent into his corner. He had no air for the last 10 seconds. But your it's arms are also time. gonna be just okay. a little bit tired. He's gassed. Yeah. Don't get into firefights with him, okay? Deep breath. Good, deep breath. Sorry, that right hand is here. Yeah. You ready for that little piece? Pull that too as well. Pull that too as well, bud. No, the, the, the guy's hands are just, yeah, he's, 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 he's really now. tired now. All right, let's work that orthodox. Stand, stand up, stand up, stand up. This was Dameron when he decided to go towards that guillotine choke. When you see him kind of sit his hips forward and he starts to press in on this choke, 
There's a lot of pressure starting to be applied. Here was the head kick right after that did land. Spike Carlisle, tough. He goes for the takedown at the end and gets himself right back into another guillotine when Dan jumps to guard. There is a lot of pressure on that. He is holding his breath. Spike Carlisle showing how tough he can be. Former UFC fighter Spike Carlisle seizing the opportunity to get back on the big stage and well found himself in big trouble at times in that opening round. Survived the first five minutes. Now let's see how well his conditioning is as he gets tagged by Moret Knee. And again, furious exchange to kick off round two. Both guys get a little wild there. Dan Moret in a position. He lands a shot, but then comes in too quick. Spike counters, lands a clean shot. And Carlisle's head kick blocked by Moret. Moret backing Carlisle up to the fence. Nice, to beautiful the front section. section of the solar plex. Dan needs to go back. Dan, the there's a right hand by kicks. Carlisle. Nice counter. And the right hand by, oh, and that left hand lead by Moret. Carlisle able to take a little bit of the sting off, but then the kick in a series of punches. Moret's in trouble. The attack. He's getting tired of those kicks. Oh, and the knee as Carlisle was going for the takedown. Kicks have landed to the body. Carlisle sucking air right now. Moret needs to keep on pushing the pace because Carlisle is losing. He's going into oxygen deprivation right now. He's got to settle himself down. And Carlisle able to buy himself some moments of respite. Moret looking to break the grip. Carlisle, I'm sure, using this as much as an opportunity to recover, John, as it is to try to maximize. This is actually very smart for Spike Carlisle. Slow it down, get your air back, get your heart rate down. And the takedown by Carlisle. Get to the top position. Great job by Spike Carlisle. That's his fourth takedown in six attempts. Moret able to pop right back up. And you wonder what that does mentally to a fighter working so hard to get the takedown, only to have your opponent back on his feet immediately. Well, right now, you saw Dameron look for the Kimura grip. He's got the arm in that position, but Spike's able to hold on to his own other hand, which stops it. Again, seven of Moret's 15 wins have been via submission. Would be looking for his first Kimura victory if he were to successfully Attempt that submission, but Carlisle again continues to hold on to Moret as we come up on the midpoint of the round and the fight. Furious pace in the first round. Carlisle trying to slow it down in the second. Carlisle looking for the spinning elbow attack. Just missed. And Moret tags Carlisle. Backs him up, front kick to the face. Look, the kicks of Moret have been a big difference maker in this fight. Be it to the leg, to the body, or to the head. He needs to go back to using those kicks. They've been very effective in damaging Spike Carlisle. Moret with three knockout victories. Remember Carlisle, 11 of his 12 wins via finish, and there was an elbow strike. Oh, oh big shots to the body. Knee. That hurt a shot dropping Carlisle. Left hand across the temple.
Moret mauling a bloodied Carlisle on the ground. Final 10 seconds of what has been a sensational second round. Carlisle desperately trying to stay in the fight, even going up for a half-hearted submission attempt. You cannot question the hardest by Carlisle, but let's not discount the dominance of Dan Moret. Absolutely right, Morrow. This it was a dominant round, even though Carlisle had his moments in the round. Overall, the big damage and all of the real good work done by Dan Moret. Now the question is, how about Spike Carlisle with a full training camp? Exactly, that's hey, the whole point. You're looking at a guy not a full camp. Take a look at this shot to the body. That body shot, that kick hurt. And you see the punches landing clearly on Spike, and he starts to actually turn away. Here comes the knee to the body. Beautiful knee landed right to the solar plex. And look at the reaction of Spike Carlisle. He starts folding and going down. Those body shots hurt. They make it to where you cannot breathe. It takes time to get it back. And Dan Moret just kept coming at him. Big, heavy shots. It's impressive to see a guy like Moret comes from a wrestling background. The kicks have been a real difference maker in this fight. A smorgasbord of solar plexus strikes by Dan the Hitman Moret. And the doctor ensuring that Spike Carlisle will be able to continue. You know Carlisle's gonna say, yes, sir, I wanna continue to fight. And he's loving that doctor right now because that doctor not only said he fight, gave him some extra time, too. Good. Good last round, come on. The bell, and the third and final round of this contract weight, 160 pounds, scrap, and it has been a spirited scrap, to say the least. Spike Carlisle making his Bellator MMA debut on short notice in the blue gloves. We'll have to pull out something almost as dramatic as his entrance to the Bellator MMA cage against Dan the Hitman Moret, who has been out striking Carlisle up to, up to this point. Definitely has been. Oh, nice straight punch. Punch. Nice straight left hand. And the left hook and right hand. Carlisle. That got her. The red is staggered. Back comes by Carlisle. Rising from the ashes. Dan Moret got stuck on that. He's still a little bit wobbly, but Spike Carlisle is exhausted. And Moret sitting down now on his punches. the opening round. Oh, since the very first time they touched gloves, they have been on fire going after each other. Here comes Dan, his hands are locked, Spike's going down to the ground. Smart move by Dan Moret. Take your time, get position, and just start wearing on him. Moret training at Henry Cejudo's gym, fight ready, more than ready to fight tonight. A well-rounded fighter, quality finisher. Half of the BJJ Brown Belt's 14 wins have come via form of choke. We have seen him go for chokes. We have seen him go for broke in this fight. Seen him go for everything and seen him hurt and seen him come back from it. Dan Lanning, those are heavy hammer fists. <laughs> Moret wearing down Carlisle. <laughs> trying to improve his position, trying to pass. Now has a back foot, is scrambled by Carlisle. Carlisle with the Iranian lift, bringing him up. He gets position. Oh, Carlisle's getting his hooks in on his back. Christmas miracle, what a finish! 
finish. What a comeback by Spike Carlisle, John. We always said it. You said tough as teak. I said how tough and gritty he was. Every time I've watched him fight, look, he was definitely behind in this fight. And then he comes and does that. That's why you never count a guy like Spike Carlisle out. Watch what happens. You see Damaret, he's on top. He goes to pass to get to mount. That's when Spike comes out of it. He goes to the point where he gets his head in between the Iranian lift as you see Moret trying to set up the triangle. And Moret gives the back. Carlisle locks in the choke and just slowly, palm to palm, starts the squeeze. Damaret in trouble here, but he's fighting through. You see when his hips start to go down. He starts to go out. He starts to fight it off. He actually pulls himself back to a better position. And then Spike Carlisle locks it in. And from that long position, there go the hips. He's in trouble, and he goes out. Step aside, Lazarus, the mother of all comebacks, currently belongs to Spike Carlisle. Now that's how you make a first impression. And it's good to see that Dan Moret is on his feet now being put on the stool as doctors ensure that he is okay after he was choked out in the third round. Losing a fight that he was dominating in stunning fashion. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, with the beer naked choke in tight, it comes to an end officially, two minutes, 58 seconds. Round number three for the winner by technical submission spike, the crucifixion. Let's go to Big John McCarthy. Spike, before I start, ladies and gentlemen, give it up one more time for Spike Carlisle and Dan Moret. What a fight. Brother, you came into this fight last minute. You took this thing with really no training camp, and you came out. We talked about how tough you were and that you never gave up. Man, did you not give up because that fight was going not in your way in a lot of the fight. You were taking body shots. How were you actually feeling throughout the rounds? Yeah, so first and foremost, all glory to the Most High God through His majestic Son, King Jesus Christ. Second, I feel like dog crap. <laughs> I don't feel good at all right now, but I had to dig deep. This is not my power, that's for sure, man. That was, that was supernatural what just happened right there, seriously. I will tell you, it was fantastic because both of you guys were putting so much out. You ended up doing an Iranian lift as you, he tried to get an inverted triangle on you. And when you got the neck, you went for palm to palm, but you finally locked it in. Did you know you had him at that point? I remember watching some of his interviews leading up to the Goichi Yamauchi fight. He said uh, he's never tapped, he will never tap. And it's true, that son of a gun did not tap. He <laughs> kept fighting, so I, I kept counting in my head, 10 seconds, move. 12 seconds, he's gotta go out soon. And thank, thank God he did. Well, I'll tell you what, congratulations on your Bellator debut. That was outstanding. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the crucifixion, Spike Carlisle. A dramatic come from behind submission win for Spike Carlisle in his Bellator MMA debut. Moret submitted for the first time in his career. Carlisle's corner. The jubilation, the ecstasy. Spike Carlisle with a dramatic Bellator MMA debut picks up his sixth submission win. And that is, well, his fourth via 
rear neck could choke probably well most likely is most memorable. Let's go to Amanda Guerra. More I got to tell you what we were going crazy up here on the fight desk. He called it supernatural. Maybe that was it. What on earth did we just witness? We witnessed someone that came in and exploded on their debut. If you are a young fighter, if you're a fighter that's talking to the promotion and talking about getting into Bellator, that's what you need to look at. That's the type of mentality you need to come in with. I will not quit. I will not give up and I will do what I can to the bell sounds in the third round or the fifth round or whatever to get the win. That was impressive. Great job by him on his debut. For people watching at home and everybody here in the stands, they have a new favorite. I got to tell you what there in Spike Carla. All right. Well, of course, we are getting ready for the main card coming up at 10 Eastern tonight on Showtime. And one of the fights we got to talk about here, Josh Hill, Jared Scoggins in the Bantamweight division. And this got a little bit more interesting over the past 48 hours or so, Josh, because Jared Scoggins didn't quite make weight. Didn't quite make weight. He wasn't even close. He was five, pound, five pounds off. And by doing that, that's a little bit unprofessional. Not a little bit, it's a lot of professional. But the gentleman, Josh Hill, has made it very clear that he will not be a gentleman in that case tonight because he missed weight by that amount of weight. When you get to like one or two pounds, that's one thing I think fighters can understand that we've all been there. Five pounds is ridiculous. And so Josh Hill's going to go out there and stamp his name on him is that's what he says. Josh is fired up right now. Uh, we've already seen explosions here tonight. Morrow, get us ready for the next one. All right, definitely a lot of action thus far. And we continue with action in the lightweight division. Achilles Amada meets Mike Hamill. Both of them looking for an important win in Bellator MMA. And now ready to make his way to the cage magic, Mike Hamill. <laughs> 29 year old Mike Hamill, well, he brought his brand of MMA magic to his last fight, John, a victory over Bryce Logan. And uh, he said that he showed what he always shows is that, well, he could take down anyone at any time on cue. Well, he had beautiful takedowns. He had good stand up. He was all over Bryce Logan for the first two rounds. And Bryce Logan came back, and, he, and Mike Hamill showed how tough he is. Mike Hamill is one of those fighters that we started watching in 2020 and into 2021 where he is a guy that does not stop coming forward. He is just fun to watch because he comes to fight. And now his opponent, Kippies Mota. Well, Hamill celebrating a victory. Mota trying to bounce back from a loss to Derek Anderson. At Bellator 251, back in November of 2020, things did not go well as he was well, stopped by a kick. And he thinks his biggest advantage in this fight are going to be his leg kicks, especially the calf kick, John, attacking the perennial nerve. Well, he, you know, if you take a look at the way Hamill has his stance, his leg is out there. He's got a wide stance, and so it is out there for Achilles to attack. Can he successfully do that? Because if he can and he starts to affect that perennial nerve, he can do a lot of damage and make it to where Hamill doesn't have much movement. I love records in fights because they don't say much about fighters when they're 8-5, and five, and the guys that they have lost to are all outstanding fighters. That is Mike Hamill, 12-2 and two for Achilles Moda. This is going to be a war. Here's Michael C. Williams. For those joining us tonight live throughout the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you to the Bellator 272 prelims. We go now to the lightweight division scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155.8 pounds. His professional record eight and five by way of Green River, Wyoming. He fights out of Phoenix, Arizona. Magic. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 155.2 pounds as a professional. 12 victories, just two losses from Registro Sao Paulo, Brazil. Introducing Kilis Marta. And the referee in charge, Todd Anderson. Moda 
Uh, back at 155 after losing to Derek Anderson at welterweight. Hamill in the center of the cage, who started wrestling at the age of four, an NCAA Division II All-American at Grand Canyon University, comes from a family of wrestlers and immediately looks for the takedown. Achilles motor very physically strong. We watched him with fighters where he just moves them around. He got a big win in his Bellator debut against Matt Del Malo. And in that fight, used that leg kick. Super effective to the point where it ended the fight. Nala was unable to stand. Mota keeping Hamill against the fence, delivering a couple of knees to the solar plexus. There's another one as Hamill trying to defend and trying to turn the tables on Mota. Mota keeping his forearm underneath the chin of Hamill, John, trying to frame him. He's framing out very well. That's keeping Hamill's head where it is up. It is not in a position to be used as a third arm. Nice technique by Achilles. Achilles Mota doing a very nice job of using that frame. You saw when he took that frame away. Right away, Mike Hamill was using his head as that third arm. Right now, it's back in place, and it's keeping Hamill unable to close that grab with the double hands on the plane. Hamill breaks and goes for a calf kick. Hamill bouncing up. Oh, nice left to the body. The left uppercut to the body by Mota. Salta Hamill fainting. Flashes the jab, John, but doesn't follow up with the left and was out of range. Exactly what Keeley's Mota needs to do. Look at that circling out. Hamill's always going to bring pressure, but you've got to circle. You cannot back straight up. You back straight up, you're putting yourself exactly where he wants you to be against the cage. Another calf kick by Hamill was also fishing for an oblique kick, and there's a low outside leg kick by Mota. Clinch. Some separation. There's an elbow on the exit by Beautiful, Mota. beautiful short elbow strike by Mota. That's the midpoint of the opening round. Mota moving to his right. Hamill coming forward, unloading with that overhand right that missed. Hit counter right hand upstairs by Mota. So a feeling out process, a tactical affair after the explosive action that we've been subjected to thus far tonight, John, at Bellator 272. Been tactical, but Mota's been very smart being able to land his shots, and he's stopped a lot of the forward aggression that Mike Hamill brings in every fight. And Hamill did land the left hand, although that kick was checked by Mota. Methodical Moda, finding his rhythm, utilizing his footwork, staying out of range. Minute and a half left in the opening round. And every time you see Hamill in that left-handed position, southpaw position, Moda can't land that leg kick the same way as when he's in the orthodox. Nice exchange. Both downstairs and upstairs, oblique kick by Hamill. Just a warning shot. Body shot by Hamill, but does not follow up. Punch shot. Oh, there's a right uppercut, and then the counter left hook upstairs by Mota. Mota being very accurate with his shots. He's not throwing a ton, but everything he's throwing, it has bad intentions, and it's been accurate in landing, so. Yeah, Hamill being credited with landing more than half of his strikes. And Mota's landed at a very high percentage as well. And oh, Hamill with the right hand behind the ear, knocking Mota off balance. 30 seconds left in the round. Straight left hand down the middle. Three punch combination. Hamill beginning to light up Mota. Mota, he knows where he's at, but he's getting hit still with shots. It only takes one more to put him in a bad position. And he changes levels. Mota muting the offense of Mike Hamill. Smart move by so he doesn't get hit anymore.
That's the kind of round that gives judges a lot of problems. You got a lot of volume on both sides, but it was in the end. You saw that Hamill did hurt Moda, had him in trouble. They might be looking towards Mike Hamill getting that round based upon that last sequence we saw with about 20 seconds left. Here comes Hamill with the knee inside, lands to the solar plex area, not all the way through. And then you see, take a look at the right hand by Achilles Mona and then the right hand by Hamill that lands and puts him down. There comes the right hand, but here's the one right behind the ear. That's the one that kind of upset the equilibrium of Achilles Mona, put him in trouble. You see, he's clear, he understands where he's at, but he needs to just close the distance, get the clinch, what eventually he was able to do. Get him up. Can we anticipate an a ratcheting up of the offense in round two, Mr. McCarthy. Well, the one thing that we know off of Mike Hamill, Mike Hamill does not slow down. Achilles Mota does slow down a little bit. A lot of fast twitch muscle fiber. He's a very explosive athlete. We'll see if he's able to you hold ready? that pace. Ready? Ready? This is round number two, Mota exploding with two punches between the guard and a kick, and now Hamill. They both jockey for position along the fence with Moda turning the tables on Hamill now. And I thought in the clinch position in the first round, Achilles Moda was able to land a lot of clean little sharp strikes, especially elbows, inside. So it's not a bad position for him to be in. Sharp jab by Moda from orthodox stance. Hamill from the southpaw position. He lands a left straight down the middle on the nose of Moda. Moda pronating that right hand. There's a calf kick downstairs by, of course, Mike Hamill. Oh, and a jumping knee attempt. Oh, and it may have jingled the bells of think, Mike Hamill. Yeah, I don't think it was the knee itself. I think it was the, the shin that followed through Michael. the lower leg. No click. Stay right here. Don't talk no bit. Take a look when he comes through here. No knee, but oh, look at the kick. Ball. You see that that foot does land. All right. Just sit right here. I don't want you to talk to your corners. I'm gonna check on him. I'm gonna give him five minutes. But also think right. of you know, think Up of the two. fact that Mike Hamill did play a one. little bit of a part Sit when tight. he's swinging that leg through. So that's why when people go, oh, there automatically should be a point. No. How you feel? Sometimes it's Good, both man. guys and what you they feel do. Better? Better. Okay. You take your time. You work it out. You tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. You're ready to go? Are you sure? Okay. It was in the flow of things. It's accidental. I'm gonna warn him and then we're gonna start. You understand? Okay. Accidental. That was in the flow of things. It's accidental. Yep. But that's your weapon. It's your responsibility. Make sure you know um, where it goes. You understand? Yeah, right now, Here referee Todd Anderson is mistaken in who is hit. Wow. <laughs> and they exchange in the center of the cage. And a, well, a naked takedown attempt that Moda's able to secure, but Hamill back up to a base. Well, I'm just glad to know that Achilles Mota was feeling okay and was ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Shoulder strike by Mota along the fence. Knee is delivered by Mota to the midsection. able to break away, create some distance, and try to unload his offense. Fainting from Orthodox now. There's a kick, calf kick that knocked Moda off balance momentarily. And Mike Hamill, we talked about it, he needs to go back to that, same as Killy's motor needs to go back to it. When that leg's out there, start to make it pay. Make that person have a problem with their balance and the ability to step forward. A great kick by Hamill, and then from Southpaw comes forward with one, two, but no bother for Achilles Mota. Mota looking to bounce back from a loss. Hamill looking to make it two straight after losing two in a row. You can see Mike Hamill just non-stop motion, always trying to come forward, always trying to put pressure on his opponent. He says he wants to make you suffer the entire time. He wants to be all up 
in your face. Gilly's motor doing the right thing, circling out. But at this time, he needs to think about it. He's got to start changing the offense and everything. He's in these close clinch positions. Nice job of turning Mike Hamill's back to the fence. Well, Hamill tells us that his biggest fear is losing a fight because he ran out of gas. Here we are with two minutes left in the second. He continues to push the pace and stay in front of Mona. Switching stance as they both kick. And there's the lead left followed by the right. The miss for Moda, but not a lot of offense. By Moda. No, Mike Hamill's continuing to land that right hand. Every time he goes to the southpaw, he's able to land that straight left right down the pipe on him. Hamill continues to target the legs of Mona. We expected Mona. He was telling us that would be his biggest advantage, something he would love to target as a little showboating from Hamill. Set him up for a polo punch. A minute left here in round two. And Mata's offense has been muted by Mike Hamill. All the movement of Mike Hamill is giving Mota just a little, because he keeps on following him now, but he's not throwing anything. He's got to start being more offensive. But so does Hamill. He's kind of waiting. Final half minute of the second round. Another oblique kick by Hamill. A lot of fainting, a lot of following. Not a lot of offense. There's Hamill with a right hook from Southpaw stands. There's a nice right hand that landed on the inside for Moda. Moda needs to start throwing straighter punches down the middle. He'll be more successful. I believe that both guys in this fight should be going after this round big time because you don't know how the judges have scored the first and the second. It could be tied. One fighter could be up 2 or We don't know. You want to leave every ounce of your fighting soul inside the cage. This is how you make your living. It definitely is not the easiest way to make a living, so you want to give yourself the best chance of success. And Hamill and Mona meet in the center of the cage in round three. And, then, well, we asked for more offense. We're getting it thus far early. Yeah, Mona throwing a good jab out and trying to find that right hand. Hamill doing the same thing, using his his right hand is a jab, trying to land that straight left down the pipe. Mata dipping his head before throwing that right hand has to be careful. Hamill can read that, maybe cut with a counter right uppercut, John. Yeah, absolutely, and when you're looking at what Mike Hamill's doing, he keeps on trying to force Mota over towards his left hand. He wants Mota to take that step that way so he can throw it straight down the pipe. Sharp jab, textbook stick from Mota. There's a lead left that splits the guard for Hamill. Minute gone here in the final frame. You notice, he, you notice how Mike Hamill keeps on stepping off and bringing his foot outside of Motors. That puts his left hand in position to go straight down the middle. And Hamill looking for the takedown in terms 
terms of the numbers, John, and it's obviously unofficial, just a, a bit of a gauge, but a, a competitive fight, and yet you, you think there's still a lot more left for both of these fighters to show here tonight. Yeah, well, you take a look and you think, well, they landed, you know, very close as far as I think Allen's landed more shots as far as volume. I thought the one shot that he landed in the first round should have given him that round, but we don't know the way the judges looked at it. And right now, both guys are in a position. They both have gas, they both have energy, and they need to use it all trying to get the win. Mona catches the kick and then goes for the, the knee. Have a lot of energy, a lot of fainting, not a lot of throwing. And now they clinch again, overhook by Hamill, underhook. Knee up the middle by Moda. Moda just touching the body of Hamill, who breaks away. Not a lot of range fighting. Not a lot of setting a, a game plan in terms of finding the range, John. No, and I, I've always, you know, as I'm watching him, Hamill's able to, able to land the kick when he goes to his orthodox, but he tends to slow down. I think in the southpaw, he's much better. I'm wondering, earlier in this round, he landed a left hand, and he Shook seems it. to be shaking it out uh, periodically. I'm just wondering where he, he not the thing in the second round. But he's still throwing the left hand, and there he eats a right hand from Mota. But yeah, John, you noticed it as well, and there was a little winch there as well. And again, we'll continue to monitor it here with just over over two minutes left in the fight, but Hamill continues to throw the left. Keeps throwing it. And there's Mona looking for the takedown. Doesn't set it up. The naked shot thus far defended by Hamill, who has given up his back. Looking for that switch, just turning into Mona. Mona's got his hands clasped at least, though, so he's got double unders. This is a good position. His best opportunity to get a takedown right now. And Hamill defending by any means necessary. Well, Hamill doing a good job. He's using that leg in, up inside. He's got the wizard on top. And the knee. And there's a shoulder strike by Moda. Under a minute and a half left in the fight. Mike Hamill and Achilles Mota going at it here in the Bellator MMA lightweight division, lording over the division. Patricky Pitbull winning the title across the pound in a rematch with Peter Quilly, the title vacated by his brother Patricio. Yeah, the new lightweight champion in Patricio, and what a big win that was. A minute left here in the third, and Mota remains stapled to Hamill, but not maximizing the position just under has that high body lock on him it, it was high but you look it's down towards the middle of the back now that's not the position you want to be in either get him down on the hips and suck the hips in or go high up underneath the arms <laughs> Hamill needs to really start to dig that, pummel that underhook, get his left arm inside there and switch this position. 20 seconds left in the fight. Bluebirds beginning to be heard here at the Mohegan Sun Arena. The fans thinking that uh, Hamill and Mata could have done more, maybe just like that, as they show appreciation for Hamill's shoe shine at the end of the round. But as we continue to say, John, if you've got that much energy at the end of a fight, you should have had a lot more fight to give. That's it. But anyway, through 15 minutes, how do you have it on your unofficial scorecard and why? Well, unofficially, you know, you can take a look at it. I thought the first round went to Mike Hamill. I don't know which way they're going to go in the second. I would say that they're going to go with Mike Hamill, but third round, I'm going to go with Keeley's, even though you got the little shoe shine from Hamill, but it could go either way. I bet it's a split decision. And again, we sit here, we call what we see, you analyze what you see, and, and far be it again, what's not to, to be critical by any stretch of the imagination, but this is your living, and this is, it's a fight, it's hard. Styles make fights, different strategies, but you got the sense watching the fight, sitting here cage side, that they did have a lot more to give to. I think they did. They both had times when they could have done things different. You watch that last Woo! bit with Hamill, when I was like, oh, he's got to dig that under. When he finally dug the under, look at what happened. He actually turned the position. That's when he did the shoe shine. Why are you waiting? Don't wait. Right, we are waiting.
waiting for the official decision. Hamill came in with a one and two record in Bellator MMA. Kelis Mota returning to Bellator. He's one and one. Woo! Go ahead, win! Brazil! Brazil! Good point, brother. Ah, Bellator! Thanks so much! I'm next check of the war! We live this! Khalees Mota used to uh, train with Glover Teixeira. One of the feel-good stories in MMA. 42, a champion. Finally, what a... What a great ambassador for the sport of mixed martial arts. Uh, Glover Teixeira, just a go, wonderful Jeff, human being. Known him forever. Awesome. All right, let's uh, get the official decision with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at Cape Side. Your first, Dave Peabody, scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees the fight for Malta. Your second judge, Dave Torelli, 29 to 28. He scores the fight for Hamill. Your third and final judge at Cape Side, Peter Rogers, scores the fight 30 to 27, showing it for the winner by split decision. Magic Mark Hamill. What are the uh, what are the uh, winning lottery numbers this weekend? <laughs> split decision. Well done, broadcast partner, Mike Hamill. Improves to two and two in Bellator, makes it back-to-back -back victories while Achilles Mota falls to one and two inside the Bellator MMA cage as he takes defeat for the second straight time. Let's go to Amanda Guerra, who is at the fight desk. Laura, thank you. What an incredible night so far. And Josh, let's talk about the first fight that we get on the main card tonight. Johnny Eblin and Colin Huckbody. Let's start with Colin Huckbody because this is his Bellator debut, and he says this is the moment, this was the call I'd been waiting for. No better opportunity than right now. You're coming in against the number five ranked guy in Johnny Eblin, and he's got to go out there and shine. Even if he's not able to get the win, he's got to make it look impressive. So he's a threat, though, to him because on the ground where Eblin likes to take the fight sometimes, he can get caught in transitions. Now, if that's the case, he's just got to keep pressing the pace, getting on that arm triangle where he likes to hit from everywhere. From the top, from the feet, from the bottom, he can hit it from everywhere. He's got a good arm bar and a good triangle as well from his back. So he's a threat when it comes to the submission game. Talk to us about Johnny Eblin here because he is undefeated going into this. Look, there's a lot of hype around him. You know what it's like to have a lot of hype around you, but you said, look, he's got to stay focused in this. This is a gotcha fight. This is one of those where you can make a mistake and you can come in unprepared or you can overthink something or, or basically take it for granted. He's got to be careful because someone you're fighting someone who's coming in on a debut. They're looking to set make their name off of you. And you being ranked so high, this is one of those gotcha fights. But he's, they call him Diamond Hands for a reason. He's fallen in love with his power. Okay, which he, maybe, <laughs> maybe he'll change his name by next fight. But he's fallen in love with his power, but his wrestling is something he's one of the best wrestlers in the 185 pound division. I'm telling you right now, he's got all the tools to beat Huck Body and beat him easily. But the hype sometimes will get to you. Diamond Hands will wait for the main card to tell you what his next nickname may be. Maura, let's send it back to you. All right, Amanda, speaking of uh, nicknames, we've got Kid a Marvelous Justin Montalvo taking on Jacob a Bone at lightweight action as we go to the tail of the tape. Big job. Yeah, Justin Montalvo with Law MMA, 25 years of age compared to Jacob Bone, 32. We'll see which guy gets the win. Here's Michael C. Williams. Bellator 272, seen live tonight in Japan. We welcome all those tuning in on Unex as we stay in the lightweight division. Set again for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at six foot, weighing in 154.8 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he brings 10 professional victories, seven defeats from Illinois, New York, presenting Jacob Jack Paul. And across the cage, his adversary, fighting under the red corner, at six foot, weighing in 154.8 pounds. He too, tonight, makes his Bellator debut. He brings an undefeated professional record at 3-0, fighting out of West Hempstead, New York, Justin Kid Marvelous Montalvo. And the referee in charge of the action, Kerry Hatley.
as we begin round one of this lightweight contest. Jacob Bone, nicknamed a Jaguar by his coach because of his speed, while Justin Montalvo, he comes in with an undefeated record, 3-0, and oh, all three wins via form of knockout, looking too well, make a knockout debut here in Bellator MMA. So both Bone and Montalvo guess an audition here on the big stage, John, during the prelims of Bellator 272. This is what you're looking for. You're looking to make that man sitting on the other side of the cage, Mr. Scott Coker, the president. You want to impress him, so he goes, I want to watch that again. This is your opportunity. You are, this is basically an audition. Bone has won two in a row. He's 10 and 7 overall with two knockouts and four submission wins. As we mentioned, Montalvo, 3 and 0, oh, three KOs. Trains out of Law MMA. Respected trainers Ray Longo and uh, Matt Serra. Authored the greatest upset in MMA history, John. I think he might have. Matt the Terror Serra against George St. Pierre back at UFC 69. My God, that was a long time ago. And Amanda Garris hometown. All right, Garrett, stop it. Let's call this fight. <laughs> a minute and a half gone here in the opening round, and Bone and Montalvo still filling up. Oh, Bone went in, used a jab to close the distance, but immediately darted back out. But Bone, most of the time, he likes to fight the stand-up. Montalvo wants to keep this standing. But the one thing at least you're seeing out of Jason Bone is right now, he's throwing. Montalvo's waiting. Montalvo's got to start just being that guy. Don't try to land a good shot. Try to land shot by Montalvo. Just shots. Beautiful body shot. And then the takedown attempt by Bone. Well defended. Well, was defended by Montalvo. But tenacity on the part of Bone. By the way, Bone has four submission wins, all four via rear naked choke. And you, you take a look, and this is what we were looking at, you know, the age and stuff, but the experience, Bone has a lot more experience than when you're, you know, Montalvo's in that position. He can, if you all of a sudden think that you could just play with someone, you can. Reversal by Montalvo. Nice escape by Montalvo. Now the half butterfly hook employed by Bone from the bottom. He's a BJJ brown belt, while Montalvo's a BJJ purple belt. Colors all about your level of experience, John, right? All about the way you transition from one technique to the other. Starts in white, ends in black. Under two minutes here in the opening round. And again, Justin Montalvo looking for like that perfect shot. Instead of looking for the perfect shot, look for the opportunities and just try to touch him. And Montalvo touched the sternum area of Bone with that right hand. Bone trying to find a way in. Nice counter by Montalvo. Picked off Bone and punched him in the face. Yeah, that left hand foul the hole there. Minute and a half remaining in the opening round. A question mark kick there delivered by Jacob Bone. Oh, he's it's interesting. Bone is trying to find a way in John and then isn't 100 percent committed or confident. It, I think you were exactly what you're saying. The confidence in his ability once left hand by Montalvo. He's trying to be defensive and smart. Oh find his position. He got picked off there by the one-two from Montalvo and Bone doing the right thing, going for the takedown. That's why he went for the takedown, and he can just keep driving forward. He can get this. Just keep moving. Montavo needs to keep that scramble going. Good job. Nice scramble and up on top. And that's the second time. He's reversed back to his feet, trying to block the knee attack of Bone. Montavo needs to ratchet up his offense here. Final 30-plus seconds of the opening round. And countered by Montavo. Montavo continues to target the body. He does. He went to the, with a right hand to the body that landed. You can see Bone did not like it and went right back to the body again with the left. There he goes again. Sloppy shot by Jacob Bone. Does not pay dividends. And there's a right hand that was looking to pay dividends for Montalvo. As we come to the end of the opening round again, nice body attack by Montalvo. Oh, he's hurting him. Making that investment and already it appears to be paying some dividends.
offense, John. No doubt about it, man. You get hit to the body. Sometimes it takes a little more than a second. All of a sudden, you start to feel it, and it's like, oh, I can't get breathe. in the air. That's what Justin Montalvo was creating with those big-time body shots. He's one of the best that guy's got. He's just going to start going downhill from now. Body shots are going to take it out of him. He already is looking for a way out. Don't kick down. He's just hitting you, okay? Let's take a look at these body shots by Justin Montalvo. Nice job right there, right at that rib. And he comes back again. A little bit heavy swing, but that one landed right to the basket. You could see Bone started to slow down, move himself away off that body shot. Like, take a look at the body, take a look at just the facial expression. He feels it. And Justin Montalvo knows it. Round two. Round two. Good job. Thirty-two-year-old Jacob Bone in his first Bellator MMA fight. Twenty-five-year-old Justin Montalvo making his Bellator MMA debut, and they want to make a an impressive first impression on the power that be, the strike stats. As a Bone gets the back of Montalvo, once again gets it, but he, he's not been able to hold that position. You can see. As far as strike stats, it's the percentage. And a lot of those were to the body. Montalvo, again, works himself back to his feet. And you're gonna see him start to attack that body once again. He got some good coaching from Ray Longo in the corner, saying, look, the body shots are killing him. Just go back to it, he's done. Always enjoy sitting under the learning tree of Ray Longo over the years. Great, great guy. Great coach, very calm, knows exactly what his fighter can do and, and funny. allows him to go to the <laughs> But nothing funny about what's going on inside the cage right now for Jacob Bone and uh, Justin Montalvo as Montalvo lands that left hook upstairs and that bothered Bone. Bone desperately looking for the takedown. He's still wearing that grimace on his face, John. Yeah, he has had problems with the punching power of Justin Montalvo. The length is giving him problems. And the accuracy of Justin Montalvo, where he's landing those shots to the body and then up to the head. Montalvo has been all about the striking game. As we mentioned, all three of his pro fights have ended due to his striking power. He's never been to the third round in his first three pro bouts, has Kid Marvelous Justin Montalvo. Telegraphing that spinning attack, John. Just a little. I saw that from my hometown of Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada. There goes Montalvo going right back to the body attack. And I want to wish everyone in my native, beautiful British Columbia all the best to some historic floods going up in that part of the world. I want everyone to stay safe as Montalvo continues to flood the zone with body shots. The only thing I want to see out of Montalvo, just a little bit more volume. And Bone goes to the body before going upstairs. Bone trying to be aggressive. Back to the takedown attempt. Montalvo shucks it off. Would you, would you call Bone's striking attack unorthodox, John? Well, he, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? Look, he does a good job of trying to move his head off, this, off the center line, but he's having problems with the length of Montalvo. Yeah. Yeah. And Montalvo's being very certain, oh, very precise, dropping Bone with that jab. You're right, accuracy. The name of the game of Montalvo now trying to break away from Bone, but Bone tenacious has his back, looking some looking for some way to turn this fight around in his favor. Well, he's doing the right thing if he's going to turn it around. Grappling is going to be the way for him to do it because he's shown so far the length of Montavo and the power is something that he's having a problem with. And as we've mentioned, Bone is all about taking his opponents back. Backs all four submissions via rear naked choke, but he continues to be hit to the body and that offense. The fatigue beginning to show in his striking. Well, that's what happens when you know, you get hit to the body a bunch. Your air starts going away. Your legs get heavy. Your arms are heavy. 
everything just starts falling apart for you. And he, and he continues to try to stay in the fight. A minute left here in the second round. Still plenty of fight left. What a to make an investment to the body. Well, Justin Montalvo, known as Kid Marvelous, and thus far, his attack to the body has been just that, BJM. Marvelous! Smart for going to the body at this point right now, make him have problems as he goes back to the store. Wow. Jay, take your time, okay? Take your time. You're being a little too active now. He's, he's waiting. Use the ice. See this real quick, bud? Go oh, though, trust me. Breathe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. The more he swells, the more you hit him. And I'm seeing that head dip in there after you throw the right. Either switch knee, right hand switch knee, or right hand left uppercut. Like when you're throwing the right at me, watch, he's going, he's dipping in. Yeah. Ray Longo giving his pupil very good advice. You see body shots by Bone, but it was the power and accuracy of Montalvo's body shots and his strikes that ends up taking the round. Take a look at those beautiful right, left to the body. Montavo landing the heavier shots right now. I have him right, up 2-0 in this round fight. Three, red, good Bone needs to find something, some way of getting him down to the ground and controlling him once he gets him there. Montavo attacking Bone's body like it was filled with candy, and it's been a sweet striking display by the 25-year-old in just his fourth professional fight. 3-0 with three knockouts, making his Bellator MMA debut against Bellator MMA newcomer Jacob Bone, who is in his 18th professional bout at the age of 32. Man, even with the, the left hand, the jab, John, great punch placement. You saw Montalvo target the sternum and then go downstairs to the body. Yeah, it's not here. Yeah, it's... He doesn't throw things fast. There's not a lot of speed to it. But there is a, an understanding of range and an accuracy to it that is making him very successful. Bone has thrown more strikes. But it's been Montalvo who has landed more. In fact, 50%. And any time you can land 50% or more, it's a pretty good night at the office, John. Not bad. You get to 50%. That means you are being very accurate with your shots, and you've got to be successful. There's a right uppercut on the inside by Bone that landed. And Bone again, just a naked shot. Easily defended by Montalvo. And Bone putting himself in harm's way with that guillotine attempt by Montalvo that Bone slips out of. Should Montalvo be putting the pedal to the metal now with less than three and a half minutes remaining in the fight, John? See, when you're seeing Bone going back and walking straight back, that's the time for Montavo to take and close that space and start landing those shots. He knows that Bone's going to be trying to come in for the takedown, but he knows that he can defend it. So watch for his head placement. You know where his head's going to go once you start to throw, or he throws and you're going to counter. So go to that area with the strike, or just dip it right back down to the body. Been the longest fight of Montavo's embryonic career but one that he has been controlling. And despite the sustained attack to the body, Bone remains standing here in the third, and again, a poor takedown attempt by Bone, but obviously a desperation measure. Yeah, we just say poor that. After you've been hit to the body as much as Bone has, and you've been hit with 50% of the strikes, you don't have a lot of speed. 
spring in your step and the ability to have an explosive take down. Good and job. target practice for Montalvo as Bone desperately tries to come back. And you wonder about the power in both arsenals at this stage. And Bone. Two minutes left and you heard the shot of that right hand to the ribcage of Bone. And there. That was nice coming up top. Beautiful combination up top by Montalvo. And Despite the fact that he's stopped all three of his previous opponents, Jacob Bone, he had the ball when it comes to dumping. Oh, another body shot, and the run. You can just look at the hand placement of Bone when he's in the stand-up. His hands are down towards his body. That's where he's been hurt. He's not even protecting his face with his hands. Montalvo remains in the same gear, John. Well, you gotta be very tight. When you take a look at this ball, yes, you want to be the best part of the shot. Left hook backs up Bone, and still walking him down. Unloading now. Bone getting punched by Montalvo. Continues to measure him up. Right now is what you're wanting to see out of John. He's trying to go for the finish now. He sees he has his man hurt. He just needs to step on the gas and get it done. Bones' hands are down. Montalvo staying out of range. Nails him with the jab. Sprawls on the takedown attempt. Right hook, left hand. Montalvo is now throwing punches from his knees. Final 30 seconds. All Justin Montalvo. Displayed by Jacob Bone. And you hear Montavo's corner screaming, finish him straight out of a video game. Justin Montavo ends up. Scoring 53% of his total strikes, almost 100 strikes landed, 97, according to our stats. And he was able to dominate Jacob Bone, but unable to stop Jacob Bone. Well, when he got inside, he started landing those strikes like he was hitting the heavy bag. <laughs> and, and speaking of which, I mean, the amount of shots that Bone absorbed to the body to go all 50 minutes, quite a testament to his fortitude. Absolutely, because, man, those hurt. A lot of the shots. Take a look up top. Montalvo starts bringing power. You see Bone trying to fight back. You say, well, you hurt me to the body. I'm going to go to your body. But then here comes Montalvo again. Throwing strikes right back to the body up top, back to the body again. He kept on going back to the body, which is something you want to see out of a young fighter. He knew what was working. He knew what was making him effective. Big left hook up top. Just wasn't able to get the finish. Take a look at those stats right there. 97 strikes landed, 97 punches landed, zero kicks, zero. Three takedowns. For Bone, but was unsuccessful to do anything with it. I think this is an easy win for Justin Montalvo. Montalvo forced to go the distance for the first time in his four fight pro career. That's a good thing, though. You need those yep. types of fights. You need the fights that push you because. Look, he was breathing hard at the end of that. He put a lot of, in that, of effort in trying to get rid of him. It just didn't happen. Who wins his Bellator MMA debut? Let's find out from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Peter Rogers, scores the fight 29 to 27. While judges Ron McCarthy and Dave Hagen both see it the same, 29-28. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision. And still undefeated, Justin King Marvelous Montalvo. Part of the learning curve.
part of the growth of a young professional mixed martial artist, 25 year old Justin Montalvo. He can say that. I love you, mama. He loves his mama. And his mama loves the fact that he was victorious in his first fight here in Bellator MMA. He is 4 and 0. Oh. Let's go back to Amanda Gaeta. Moro, thank you so much here alongside Josh Thompson. Want to dive into the main event we got coming up starting at 10 Eastern tonight, Horaguchi and Pettis. And it, it's just so hard to describe how much anticipation, excitement there is for this. Let's talk about Kyoji Horaguchi and what he has going into this. Vacating the belt back in 2019. He already got his rising belt back. He's after this one, and part of the thing that is so lethal for him, according to you, is his confidence coming into this. Yeah, once you've retained your Horizon title and you went out there and earned it and got it back, you realize that you can go back and get it done again in Bellator. And so the power he possesses in terms of how he got his title back in the Horizon, the leg kicks, the power. He was fighting one of the best kickboxers in Japan over there. He came out and dropped him with leg kicks and put him away with the hands. Then he fought Tokuro, and Tokuro is a really good grappler, but he's gotten a lot better with his striking as well but man the timing the speed the power that Horiguchi possesses is incredible when he went back and he had fought when he had fought Darian Caldwell sure he kept getting taken down but Darian Caldwell was also a, a national champ in wrestling a stud wrestler he was someone that sure even though he was getting taken down he was always threatening always getting back to his feet he is the real deal, and the confidence has gotten better since he's gotten his rising title back. The guy who has the belt right now, Sergio Pettis, we have to talk about him really quickly, finally stepping out of the shadow of his brother. And the reason this fight is so good and so close, because he's gotten exponentially better very quickly. Yeah, if you look at what he's done just him recently in his last couple fights, okay? When he fought Kashaki and he dropped him with big power shots, then he started almost trying to put him away. Then the smartness of him, the intelligence of how he has grown as a fighter, jumps on the neck right Right away, gets the finish, puts Kashakian out. Beautiful work by him. That is a mature fighter, someone who's thinking for themselves how to get it done faster than just and expending himself too much. Then he comes out and he fights Juan Archuleta. The story in that fight was he was getting off first, and Juan was always a step behind. But even when Juan got the takedown, he was able to get back to his feet, and that's how he secured the title. Great performance. He's going to have to do that again tonight. You can feel the anticipation already building inside this arena. Mora, we'll send it back down to you for more on the prelims. Thank you very much. And yes, we continue to roll with prelim action, welterweight division. Levon Chokoli trying to bounce back from his first career loss against Vinicius de Jesus. John, he's trying to snap a two-fight losing streak. Well, take a look at 25 years of age, a very young but powerful Levon Chokoli who knocked out in every win against 3-1-year-old Vinicius de Jesus. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Mohegan Sun Arena, we'll go now to the welterweight division scheduled. For three five-minute rounds, we introduce first the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 169.6 pounds. His professional record, nine and four from Puerto Alegre, Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, presenting Vinicius de Jesus. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner. At six foot, weighing in 170.8 pounds. As a professional, he's near perfect at nine and one from Tbilisi, Georgia. Introducing Levan Chokeli. In charge, your referee Dan Mugliano. Vanderford, the next to challenge gate guard Musasi. Yeah, both of these guys are very happy they're not in against stud wrestlers right now because that doesn't help. You know, it, when you want to be that striker and you have the power, especially the power that Chokli has, has, he wants to be on his feet. De Jesus, very good with his movement, very good with volume strikes. We'll see what wins, the volume or the power. De Jesus. 
Now at 170 here, and that was Chokley. a clean, clean right hand by Chokley. And Chokley's landed a lot of them in his career. Nine wins, nine knockouts, looking for his death. On to Jesus here in the opening minute of the first round. Chokley making a mistake by actually getting into the, allowing that glitch to happen. He actually created it. That's helping to Jesus clear his head. Blood already on the face of De Jesus. Ate a right hand, just missed. Did Chokley with the left kick. De Jesus is, he has eaten several right hands, and that's why you see him going for that takedown. And secures it, but ends up on his back with Chokley working from the close guard of the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt who started training BJJ with his father when he was 12 years of age. In fact, De Jesus began his pro career with a 24 second knockout of Anderson Silva. No, we're all Anderson Silva. Not that Anderson Silva. <laughs> needs to be careful with that left arm. You see that glove on the ground. You see the overhook on that arm. That's a way for De Jesus to start setting up submissions. He needs to get that hand off the ground onto the chest area. And like all fighters, Chokley wants to earn more bucks for his bang, and well, so far he's earned more money per second than many of his peers. All nine wins have come via first round KO. Well, you could just see in the, you know, the first part of this round, the power that he possesses in that right hand. When it lands, you see the effects on his opponent. All the way going to the opening round, hammer fist and left hands from Chokley, posturing up. This is if you're De Jesus, you're saying, I want to slow this fight down, get the ability to crush the space. That'll keep Ch Chokley from be having power. But right now, he's not able to do that. Chokley's able to posture, and when he's posturing, he's landed big shots. Final two minutes of the first round. De Jesus active from his back, throwing up elbow strikes, trying to cut Chokley. Utilizing active guard, trying to control Chokley's posture after tasting some of his power. You can see right away, right now, we're trying to bring in a high guard goal to an Plata. Keeps on trying to bring that up and over, get Chokley to move to the side. The Omoplata attempt did not work. But that's an active guard, like you're saying, and that's exactly what De Jesus needs to do because when you are defending, you're not throwing strikes. And he's throwing strikes from the bottom. Chokley trying to posture up and begin to deliver some ground and pound again from the guard if he's capable. De Jesus has two rear naked choke submission wins. Chokley is just a very strong striker. You can just see in that hammer fist how much power he can generate from a short distance. And yet it is De Jesus who is active from his back and while not even coming close to getting a submission, is, is the one being offensive from his back, Chokley. Yeah, I'll tell you, you'll see when Chokley starts landing just a couple of heavy shots because of the fact that De Jesus has not been able to lock up any type of submission. Yes, he's landing some hammer fist, but not enough to and change this round. Switching, and there's a hammer fist to the midsection, right hand to the body by Chokley, under 30 seconds left in the first. Almost a good sweep attempt right there. De Jesus looking to get that sweep or that submission, but right now, Chokley defending against all of it. Solid opening round for Levon Chokley, who again coming off his first career loss. Looking to bounce back tonight. It's hard enough to fight when you're on a winning streak. Both these fighters well, you're well, when need to get back body, on the winning track. Elbow. Absolutely. You know, the real question was, how would Chokley, how would he respond off of that first loss? Because sometimes guys don't respond well. He has absolutely shown he's back and he's doing damage in the range that he's so good at. Watch his shot. That right hand lands. That one didn't land so well, but there was the next one. That kick comes up top. Watch the big right hand that lands. That was the same sequence right there. Comes with the kick up top, and then the right hand 
just misses but gets into the clinch. And then some ground and pound, and some of it was heavy. You watch some of the hammers fist to come down. A lot of power, big right hand right there. Vinicius been trying to hold that position, break his posture down so he cannot be damaged. Let's go. Second round, Chokely said about his fight against Crutchmer. He felt preparation was great, John, but he, he felt he, he didn't recover enough from the weight cut, and that slowed him down in the fight. And of course, Kyle Crutchmer, full value for the victory. And we saw him utilize his wrestling pedigree as Chokely goes for the head kick and lands on De Jesus. And again, Chokely needs to stop crushing the space. He's doing damage when he's at range. Switches to South Body's comfortable switching stances. And you're right, John. Staying at range, giving himself all the opportunity to do the most damage. You gotta take a look at where you are being successful. And if you are being the guy that's able to control what is happening from that range and land good shots, don't crush the space and allow your opponent to switch up what's happening. The Jesus, wow. Beautiful job by Chokely. Putting De Jesus using De Jesus momentum, putting him on his back. Where's the uptake? And Chokley says, I prefer you stand up. That's a smart move by Chokley. You can see the difference in their ground games. Who's going to be effective? Chokley in the stand up right now has been the guy landing the better shots. There he lands a solid one two before switching back to self. Jesus leads with a right kick that fails to land. A minute and a half gone in the second round. Neither interested in establishing the jab, John. No. Both guys just swinging away, trying to land the big shots. Left hook very close to landing on the mark. Choke the kind of slowing down a little bit. Jesus trying to put the pressure on him. And you hear the corner calling for the jab. Chokely gets caught with a counter left. There's a low upside kick lands for Chokely. Avoids the return fire from Jesus. Make that midway point of the round and fight. Levon Chokley in the red gloves, Vinicius De Jesus in the blue gloves, both back looking to get back into the win column. Take down attack. That was stifled by Chokley. Very nice job by Chokley to get his hips back because De Jesus did get deep on that. He's still in a position where he can work for this takedown, having him up against the cage, but that was very nice defense by Chokley getting those hips back. Right now, this is an important moment for De Jesus. He has been on the bottom every time. If he can get to the tough position, you see what type of damage or what type of position he can get into to go for a submission. <laughs> Of punches. Chokely 25 of 65. De Jesus just 9 of 40. He hasn't landed that many, and that's you know part of has been the position that he's been on the ground, but his back on the ground for a lot of that first round. He's landed some good knee strikes in here. This is all good work, but he needs to work towards getting Chokely on his back. And one area where De Jesus has landed more is in terms of the knee strikes and uh, much to the delight of the crowd. The referee restarts the action in the center of the cage. 45 seconds left in the second round. A little more energy by Chokley coming out. Nice jab so for that right hand. From Southpaw. 
dispenses with the jab and leads with the left kicks to the body by De Jesus. De Jesus tries to establish the jab, but out of range. Chokley looking for that front kick, and well, De Jesus looking for some final seconds. Dramatics. Coming up at 10 Eastern, the final Bellator MMA event of the year continues with the main card of Bellator 272, the highly anticipated main event. Sergio Pettis squares off with Kyoji Raguchi to determine the Bellator bantamweight champion. Yes, Pettis holds the belt. Horiguchi, former champ, never lost it in the cage, had to surrender the title after he injured his knee that required surgery. And the rest of the card, number four ranked Emmanuel Sanchez against number nine, Jeremy Kennedy in the co-feature at Featherweight. Ten minutes on your unofficial scorecard. No, no doubt you had Chokley win in the first round. The second round is close. I can see the judges going both ways. I think both guys really, really need to go after this third round and put their stamp on it. But Chokley, I would say, is ahead too. Long. Down the right hand by Chokley lands upstairs. Side low kick by Chokley now switches back to Southpaw and Orthodox trying to befuddle, trying to disrupt whatever rhythm De Jesus is trying to establish and hasn't been a lot of that for him in this fight. No, you know, De Jesus hasn't been able to land with the volume that he normally does. He's not the guy that has the you know, huge punching power, but he normally puts a lot of volume and he lands a lot of strikes on his opponent. He hasn't been able to do that against Chokley. Done a better job with the knees and kicks than with the punches. A minute gone here in the final round. And again with both fighters. De Jesus having lost two straight. Chokley coming off his first defeat. You, you want to get back into that win column. But at the same time, you, you want to continue to impress. And there is an impressive one too by Chokley. So that right hand left is at least going to leave an impression that was clean and power on it by Chokley. Lead right hand by Chokley back to Southpaw, left kick upstairs. There's the jab that popped De Jesus head back momentarily. De Jesus bounces a kick off the right arm of Chokley. And De Jesus looking for the takedown with three minutes left in the fight. Nice job of finally working towards that takedown. Sometimes that fence can be your friend, sometimes it is your enemy. And when he first drove it back, he had Chokely going, but the fence actually was a balance point for him. But he was able to fight through it and get Chokely to the ground. De Jesus securing his second the takedown of the fight. Final two and a half minutes of this matchup between Levon Chokely and Vinicius De Jesus in the Bellator MMA welterweight division. Chokely on his back. Chokely on his back. This is De Jesus's time to really start to work, put a lot of pressure on him. Right now, he should be going more towards knee on belly, moving the position. Chokely's not that guy that has that big gas tank where he just goes all the time. I think Vinicius is in better condition. I think he can push the pace. I think he can try to make the submission happen by putting pressure on Chokley. Well, we talked about Chokley having all nine of his wins come via first round knockout. Seven of those were in under one minute, so 
He is in the third round for just the second time in his career. Went the distance in his last fight, the loss to Crutchman. Well, you saw Vinicius went to the knee on belly. And now inside control to Jesus. Again, knee on belly, sliding across. Beautiful reversal, nice sweep by Chokley. Beautiful timing by Chokley to go with the momentum as De Jesus stepped across from out. Used his momentum to kick that position back. Guys at the top. Huge sweep by Chokley with a minute 15 left in the bout. And a couple of right hands followed up by a left from Chokley. Final 60 seconds of this fight. Right there is the problem that you're seeing with Chokley in this third round. No setup, just throws the one big shot. You need to go with combinations. Use your hands to then hide your kicks, but don't just throw ones, and that's what we're seeing from both fighters right now. Zeus hey. with that right uppercut left hand, both missed. Both guys needing to do more in that third round. You saw Vinicius getting the takedown, getting position. A nice reversal of the position by Chokli to get himself out, but neither guy able to establish much offensively. Chokli landing the heavier, harder strikes throughout the round. I believe he's going to end up with the win. You can take a look at those strike stats. Very close as far as what was landed, 51 to 46. One take down for Chokley, two as far as Vinicius getting it down. All the stats very close. The difference was the power that landed. I think that's what the judges are going to look at. I think that's why Chokley is going to end up with a victory tonight. C. Williams has made his way into the Bellator MMA cage. He will announce the name of the winner. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision to go to your judges' scorecards, where Dave Turelli scores the fight 29-28, and judges Ron McCarthy and Mike Murtha both see it the same 30-27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Levon Chokali. fight he took an L tonight he bounced back Levon Chokoli with a victory over Vinicius de Jesus moving to 10 and 1 with one no contest evening his Bellator MMA record to 1 and 1 as de Jesus well he drops his third consecutive fight more prelims still to come Every single day, I think about this fight. This could be your last walk. I'm prepared for war. I'm actually at my best when people doubt me. A puncher who's proven he can pound his opponent into submission with a single left hook. 
I've been watching y'all join, man. We move culture, we yeah. shift culture, we are culture. We're gonna make this legendary. Yeah. You know, I want all the smoke. You think that fight comes to fruition? I think it should. <laughs> this guy might kick my ass. I ain't gonna let that happen. You're one of my favorite guys to talk fights with. This was the crown jewel of the combat sports weekend. If you want to fight for the belt, fight ranked opponent. That's what motivates me to keep doing this. You're going in there to fight. Coming up next, it is our main event. John, we're going to get ready for the tale of the tape for this featherweight matchup as John DeJesus meets Kai Kamaka III, who looks to go 3-0 inside the Bellator cage in his return. Kai Kamaka coming back to Bellator, 69-inch to 76. Kamaka is an inside fighter. That's where he needs to get against DeJesus. We'll see if he can get there. Here's MCW. Tonight here, Bellator 272, we go now to the featherweight division, set for three five-minute rounds, introducing the blue corner. At five foot seven, weighing in 146 pounds even, as a professional, eight wins, four losses, one draw from Kapula uh, Hawaii, Kai Kamaka. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner. At 5 foot 10, weighing in 145.6 pounds. As a professional, 14 victories, 9 defeats. By way of Hollywood, Florida, he fights out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. John Platano de Jesus. In charge, referee Brian Miner. points from the referee. He has gotten better and better as a fighter. He's taking his time. He's fighting smarter. It was one of the things that we didn't think at the beginning. Fight IQ wasn't there. He's been fighting very smart recently. Let's see if he continues. Winless in his last three, including a disputed draw against Danny Chavez back in July, but returning to Bellator, where, as we mentioned, 2-0. Against DeJesus, who is 2-1 and one inside the Bellator MMA cage. The loss coming to Aaron Pico. Bellator 252, and boy, Aaron Pico has definitely turned things around since moving to Jackson Wink MMA John. Aaron Pico is on fire right now. He is, he is learning how to be a fighter. He's learning the fight game. He's learning the mentality he needs. And that guy is going to be a champion. Kamaka with a right hand to the body. De Jesus from the southpaw stance, fainting. A lot of nervous energy coursing through his veins, trying to get Kamaka to bite down. Of course, A.J. McKee manifested the million-dollar dream, right, winning the Bellator shot. MMA Featherweight Grand Prix, supplanting Patricio Pitbull as champion in the process. He lords over the 145 division. Two minutes gone here in the first. We were seeing really good pressure from Kai Kamaki. He was coming forward with a high stick to the body. He needs to continue that forward pressure when he's standing still. That's not where he needs to be because of the range is always going to be in the favor of De Jesus. Cap kick by the southpaw De Jesus. On the back foot. Body kick again connects for Kamaka midway through the opening round. Look at the speed on that kick. That came out quick. It had power on it. That's what you're looking for. Kamaka wrestled in college at the NAIA level. Of course, when you watch.
watch Kai Kamaka. You watch him always coming forward. He says win or lose, he is always going to be the one pushing the pace and going for it. He's four and one. Still looking for his first knockout victory. Has a rear naked choke win that came back in August of 2014. I've always enjoyed watching Kai Kamaka fight because he comes to fight. He is always, as he says, moving forward, looking to end the fight. But the guy that he's up against right now, De Jesus, very athletic, has good movement, is difficult to pin down so you can land those strikes. Good right hand by Kamaka. He's trying to lock up. Jesus says he's one of the hardest working fighters in the game. Has a grueling day job. He trains almost every day of the week. He wants to control the range against Kamaka. Well, that is absolutely the way for him to get the victory. If he controls the range, Kamaka's not going to be landing much. But, it, but Kamaka's landing those body kicks. That's because he's using his feet to come inside when he decides to attack. He's got to continue to move on his feet. Nice little balls right there that right you want to see. Landed by Kamaka. Beautiful. Left kick inside, low kick, and going to the body was De Jesus, showcasing some of his own dexterity with kicks. Final 30 seconds of the opening round. And Kamaka going upstairs, left hook, left to the body, then again, that body kick with his right leg continues to find a home, John. It does, you can, you know, all, what you're seeing out of De Jesus, he wants to bring his hands out like what? No, it landed, and it landed clean, and you gotta figure out a way to stop it. And De Jesus unable to stop the takedown at the end of round one. Very nice round for both fighters, but Kai Kamaka was able to be the guy that controlled that distance, landed the heavier shots, and overall, Kai Kamaka should be getting that round, 10-9. everything out. What you got? Look at the body kicks. Now that's blocked on the arm, but it doesn't feel good on the arm itself. De Jesus eating a lot of shots as far as those arms are going to get heavy. You can actually break your arm on trying to block a kick. He did try to bring his other hand over to slow it down. We'll see what happens in the second round. Second round, 31-year-old John De Jesus, 14 and 9, five knockouts, two submissions, two and one in Bellator. He is in the red gloves and the blue gloves. Kai Kamaka the third, eight, four and one, with one rear naked choke, unbeaten in Bellator MMA at two and zero, oh, and fighting for the first time in Bellator MMA since that amazing night. Bellator 236, December 21st, 2019, in Hawaii, and he just ate that sharp jab from De Jesus. That snapped his head back. There's a clean strike by De Jesus. De Jesus throwing a lot of feints, different things. Bringing the knee up, looking for the kick. Another great sharp jab by De Jesus catching Kamaka. Doesn't follow up with the left and goes downstairs. Calf kick. That kick blocked by Kamaka, but like you say, John, even if you block with your arm, it will hurt. You feel it. Ask Frank Shamrock how it feels to catch a kick from Kung Lee. Body shot by Kamaka. Look 
at the difference in the power that's landed. Jesus has got speed and he's got little, you know, the punches are snapping out. They don't have a ton of power. And when Kabaka is landing that kick, Marl, it has power on it. And he's been diligent in maintaining the attack to the body before going upstairs with a beautifully executed overhand right. I was and a left hook. And De Jesus weathering the, the storm of the fighting Hawaiian Kai Kamaka. And that's his nickname. <laughs> Guy Kamaka needs to start up at the pace a little bit. Right now, he's starting to get that feel. He's closing the distance. He's not throwing. When you're getting into that range, start throwing things and making John De Jesus have to react. You have to appreciate the work to the body. By Kai Kamaka the third has De Jesus bouncing up and down on his feet. Moving side to side, flashing the jab of Kamaka again, going to the body with the right hand. And De Jesus unable to detonate John. When you're seeing that kick come up, that right kick, you're seeing De Jesus block. It is blocking. I would tell Kai Kamaka to keep going back to it because that arm is not going to have any power on it when it comes out when he really tries to throw. And Kamaka has drawn first to blood, literally blood, trickling out of the nose of De Jesus. Nothing to worry about with under two minutes left in the second. Well, nothing else to worry about. I'm sure it hurts De Jesus, but not in a place that will should stop the fight from, uh, we're being told, from a head clash. Yeah, that, that was when they, they came together. Kamaka's top of his head ended up causing that little bit of blood in the nose of John DeJesus. Sometimes it's hard to see those things. A minute and a half left in the second. Kamaka in front of DeJesus, who again, fainting. There's that push kick to the midsection of Kamaka. Kamaka launches the right hand. Let's do that more often. And again, the right hand to the body before another jingling of the bells. Okay. Well, you got the holiday spirit, don't you? It's December. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Okay. Stay right there. Unless you're Kai Kamaka right now. Left kick came up straight up the middle there. A lot of it is. Uh, trying to get out of the way when he sees the strike coming with the Which counter. Let's go. And uh, despite having the option of taking five minutes to recover, Kai Kamaka says, let's get it on again. Coming up on the final 60 seconds of the second. I'm sure De Jesus corner would love to see an uptick in his offensive output. There's a is not attacking. Kamaka got stuck there. Three, two, three, two. 30 seconds left in the second. Another body kick by Kamaka. And another right hand jigging to the rib cage of De Jesus. So Kamaka has indeed recovered under 20 seconds left in the second. De Jesus unable to capitalize on having Kamaka momentarily in trouble, but able to stuff the takedown attempt by Kai Kamaka the third as we go to the third and final round. Look at me. You're fucking better than this kid. You're letting him in the fucking fight. You understand me? Put a pace on this guy, baby. Put your jab hand in his face. High low level changes. One bodies. Add your hook. Don't let this fucking kid in the fight. Go gas pedal this motherfucker. Yes. This is where that blooding of the nose. Watch the heads. Bink, right there, you see them clash heads. That's what ended up causing the bloody nose on De Jesus. But there was the shot, that beautiful left hand touching the chin of Kai Kamaka.
It's going to be interesting to see if that shot, Hakamaka was winning that round. That one shot hurting him might have switched it to the judge's mind. Kamaka has been TKO twice in his career as we begin. The third and final round. Ty Kamaka, the third in his third Bellator MMA bout, returning after a state of the UFC wild. De Jesus looking to improve to three and one inside the Bellator MMA cage. And John, they remain standing in front of each other. A lot of fainting, not a lot of punching. And there is a takedown by Kamaka. So after tasting the power of De Jesus, Kai Kamaka the third says, you know what, I've done well with going to the body. Maybe I should take it down to the ground. Not a bad idea because what you're doing is at least you're putting it in the mind of De Jesus that I'm not going to just sit here and spar with you at the stand-up range. I'll put you on your back and I'll try to do damage to you when you're on the ground. Watch the arm triangle. Kamaka needs to ride his hips up a little bit farther. He's in that arm triangle position, but right now he's not going to be able to get it from where he's at. He's trying to reach to get the right arm of De Jesus. De Jesus on that elbow is looking to post up, get himself back to his feet. Let's go, Doug. Keep working. Risk control. Risk control. Keep working up the cage. Risk control. Risk control, Doug. Nice job by Kakamaka to pull his hips back. Trying to get him so his back is not against the cage. Now he's trying to drive him straight to his right side so he can get his back onto the canvas. He's all good work by Kakamaka. Try telling that to the crowd here in some way in Sun Arena. I hear you, Johnny. You're right. It's all good work. He's the one dictating where this fight's at. He's the one in control of it right now, and he's the one that can do the best damage. Under three minutes left in the fight. The Jesus controlling Kamaka's posture, trying to perhaps force a stand-up with time ticking away in the fight. Jesus with that half guard position, he's going to have to figure out a way to either get him back to a full guard so he can start to attack him with some type of submission, or he's got to get Kakamaka off of him and back to his feet so he can get back in this fight because he's losing this round right now. told us that it was his, his grappling, his ground control, ground and pound, his wrestling that are all his biggest strengths as a fighter. Well, an opportunity here with less than two minutes left to make those attributes work in his favor if he can. Well, he's making them work right now. He's riding up a little bit higher. Now he's got Jesus away from the cage. Can't use that to get himself back up, so now he's got to use technique and skill in the open mat area. Much more difficult. You see this far side underhook, that right arm of Kai Kamaka. When it's in position under it, it's very difficult for De Jesus to get him up and get back to his feet. Moving himself back to the cage. Nice movement by De Jesus. We'll see if he can get himself back to his feet. Final minute of this featherweight matchup between John De Jesus and Kai Kamaka the third. Should be more urgent. Nice reversal. You, know, right up. you didn't even get to say it should be more urgency. An urgent I was display by De Jesus. But again, 15 seconds left. 
and he's got one hook in. Too high. But backdoor escape by Kamaka. And Kai Kamaka, the third, should improve to 3-0 here in Bellator MMA. It'll be up to the judges. So Kamaka looking to bounce back winless in his last three fights John and you mentioned close affairs the, the draw could have gone in his favor in his last fight and and you're wondering if he what would you think about his return to Bellator MMA going 15 minutes tonight no I thought he fought very well and you're taking a look at what happened in those three fights look he lost the first one no doubt about it he got TKO but the second one it was a split decision. It could have gone to either guy. They both fought their butts off. And then he actually won the, the next fight, except he got a point taken away, and that made it a draw. Take a look at the fight stats here. 43 strikes landed by De Jesus compared to 50 for Kai Kamaka. The kicks landed. It was the power of the kicks of Kai Kamaka. A lot of the ones that he threw up were blocked, so those aren't counted, but they had an effect. And the two takedowns, especially the one in the third round, that third round was a big round for Kai Kamaka as far as controlling and doing damage. Hey. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision to go to your three judges at cage side where all three have it the same 29 to 28 for the winner by unanimous decision kai kamaka kai kamaka the third back in the win column and now a perfect three and oh here in bellator mma defeating john de jesus via unanimous decision let's go to amanda guerra Moro, thank you. We got to talk about the last fight we have coming up tonight on our prelim card, and it is a great one. Alexander Shabley going up against Bobby King. Let's find out more from Gareth A. Davies. The Russians are advancing in force, and amongst them, one of the invaders, Alexander Shabley, takes on Bobby King at lightweight tonight. Shabley from Perezvet, heavy handed and clever in the submission game, comes here on a five fight winning streak, including his Bellator debut, in which he claimed a decision victory over England's Alfie Davis. Shabley has ambitions on that 155 pound title, and of course, gaining a stronghold on the ladder of success as he seeks a top 10 ranking. That will likely come next year, but across the cage from him tonight is Bobby King, who is on a four fight winning streak himself. Strong in the submission game, by record, and handy in the stand up as well. He was victorious by split decision on his Bellator debut against Nick Newell in June. King, fighting out of Leighton, Utah, by way of Maui, Hawaii, told me that he is on a journey to make a statement and show I'm the man, I'm elite. You only get one chance in your life to live, he says, and you've got to leave your mark. Russian grit and grind matches Hawaiian steel tonight, and may the best man win. Our tail of tape for this lightweight matchup. Look out for Alexander Shabley. He is dynamic on the feet. Big difference in age, 28 years of age. He's right in the prime, 37 years of age for Bobby King. Let's see who gets it done. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. From Mohegan Sun Arena, the time has come to conclude the Bellator 272 prelims with three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 5'9", weighing in 156 pounds. His professional record, 10 wins, 3 losses, fighting out of Kingsville, Utah, by way of Lahaina, Maui, Hawaii, presenting Bobby. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5'9", weighing in 155.4 pounds as a professional. 20 victories, 3 defeats from Rostov, Russia, Alexander Shabli. In charge, referee John English. Round one, come on. Bell in round one, 
Shabley has won five in a row, made his Bellator debut at Bellator 259 in May of this year, defeating Alfie Davis via unanimous decision. Bobby King turns 38 December 9th. He's won four in a row. He made his Bellator debut at Bellator 260 back in June, defeating Nick Newell via split decision. Nice low leg kick right on that calf by Shabley. One of the things about Shabley is his stand-up is really sharp, very technical, and his wrestling is outstanding, too. He can take the fight to the ground at any time. If he likes to establish that in the mind of his opponent. He'll just all of a sudden take you down, then get up to go back to the stand-up. Bobby King, always aggressive, always looking for the big shots. Shabley, 10 of his 20 wins have come via form of knockouts. Half of King's 10 victories have been via submission. Coming up at the top of the hour on Showtime, Bellator 272 main card. Four fights culminating with the highly anticipated showdown for the Bellator Bantamweight Championship. As Shabley with that left hook, crashing into the face of King. He stung him with that shot. Saw right away Bobby King had to take some backward steps. Pettis defending against former champion Kyoji Horiguchi. Never lost the title inside the cage. Was forced, well not forced, decided to not hold the division hostage, John. Doing the honorable thing, relinquishing the title. He is now a two-time rising champion, but man, we will determine. The best at 135 in the Bellator 272 main event is Shabli and King exchange. And King changes to Southpaw. King still trying to bring pressure, trying to come forward on Shabli. Shabli's length, his range is starting to give King some problems, and he's eating that counter left hand. Midway through the opening round, it's King putting the pressure on. Shabley, Shabley able to utilize lateral movement, resets in the center of the cage. And good takedown by Shabley, taking the sweeping the right leg off of King out from under him, but King active on his back. So what I was talking about with Shabli, all of a sudden he will just switch it up, go to the wrestling, get his opponent down to the ground. Right now, in half guard position, this is a great place for him just to do some nice ground and pound work. King working hard to get him back to a full guard. King battering the body of Shabli from his back, but Shabli putting the pressure top position. Shabli doing some nice little work inside, looking for the position change. He was looking for the arm triangle, switched it back. Bobby King landing some strikes right now. Pretty even as far as what's happened on the ground. Final minute of the first frame. And our final preliminary bout here at Bellator 272 from Mohegan Sun Arena, the final Bellator MMA event. Of the year, Mount. Shabli again looking towards that arm triangle. He lets it go for that mount position. Bobby King needs to keep on slipping his hips, start wiggling. Shabli has seven submission wins. Very well rounded individual, one of the best prospects out of Russia. Outstanding prospect out of Russia. He's got great stand up. He's able to change the you know the course of the flow of the fight by taking to the ground because he's got a really good wrestling also. You can see Bobby King knows how to get someone out of the mount position. He's unable to do it sharply. Heavy hips, good base, good positioning.
Not a whole lot of damage done by either fighter, but if you go back and you remember, Shabley did land the shot that hurt Bobby King early in the round. I think that was the main uh, thing, if you're going to say, with a big difference of the, of the round, we're going to have to go 10-9 for Alexander Shabley. You got to get that pummel, though, right? If he takes it down. Sometimes are hard to see that make it to where he lands the shot. He's got a lot of basic position, meaning he's heavy in the top position. He's hard to move. Bobby King knows what he's doing there on the ground on his back. But he's unable to upset the balance of Alexander Shop. I love a great quote as much as the next guy, Bobby King. Supplied us with one from Les Brown. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have one and not be prepared. And Bobby King, who again just days away from turning 38, looking to make the most of this opportunity. As is Shabley. Bobby's doing a good job of defending. He's trying to actually be offensive from that position off his back and see that Shabley keeps shutting everything he's doing down. Nice job of getting his back to the cage. We'll see if he can get himself back to his feet from here. Without grabbing the cage. But notice that Shabley's got his arms locked around him. He's got that nice gable grip. That's going to make it very easy for him if Bobby works hard to get back to his feet to bring him right back down to the ground. but just momentarily as Shabley takes him down again and this time going to full mount. That's, you saw Shabley setting that up. You saw him unlock the hands. You saw King getting up and as soon as King was rising, you saw the hands go back to the gable grip. He had the position to get him down and now falls right into a mount position from there. Dominant position. Advancing his position in the fight. And how does he continue to maximize it? How does he continue or attempt to do more damage from this position? Well, what we want to see is the first thing is you see he's got Bobby King's head up against the cage. And he doesn't want to get his back there, but he, want, he should be posturing and start to create a space that allows him to land heavy 
strikes. King making it difficult as he's very active from the bottom and looking for perhaps a looking to attack that leg but against the fence. The as we are near the final minute of the second round, but King trying to reverse. Well, notice the arm triangle is yep. in place right here. Nice job. Brings beautiful pass by Shabley into the half guard position from there. Shabley has never secured an arm triangle submission victory. He does have seven submissions total. But King doing a yeoman's Effort are trying to defend against Shabley, putting all kinds of pressure on him from top position. Under 30 left in the round. And right now in this position, you want to see Shabley get off of his knees, bring his head up into the range of where you see Bobby King's head right there. That way you can either step through or you can land heavy shots. Well, the final preliminary fight of Bellator 272 will see a final round between Alexander Shabley and Bobby King. You talk about a wrestling stud, you talk about Steve Mako, an NCAA Division I legend and uh, a man in the corner helping Alexander Shabley prepare for this third and final round. Shabley representing Fighting Club of Paris Vet and American Ready, Top Team. Ready, you good. Last round, boys. Bobby Come on. King. Owns a gym in Utah called Koa Kingdom. He cross trains weekly in Colorado with Dwayne Ludwig. Final round. And King coming forward and going to the body. Rapid fire combination. I think you call it a shoe shine, Big John. It is a shoe shine, but you look at it. Oh, left hooks, and it's all King to start round three. Absolutely. I love that he's going after him saying, No, I think I'm down. I need to do something. Let me give it everything I've got. What I'm seeing out of yes, right the now. sense of urgency that you love to see, and there's a takedown by Shabley, and that will neutralize King momentarily, but King very busy, very active off his back, but Shabley able to stem the tie. A beautiful tie chose by Alexander Shabley, throwing Bobby King onto his back. All technique in that takedown. But that's exactly, as we mentioned, John, what you want to see out of a Bobby King to, to start the third and final round. Oh, yeah, you see the guy say, well, I got to do something. I got to make this fight happen. I got to, I think I need to finish, and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go after him. That's what he was doing. And again, just six days away from turning 38, the clock is ticking on Bobby King's MMA career. Undefeated here in Bellator again with that split decision win over Nick Newell at Bellator 260 in June, but in tough against Alexander Shabley, who was also 1 0 in Bellator. You're talking about a guy with a ton of talent in Shabley. Nobody wants to fight this guy. He's yes. that talented. Bobby King takes the fight. And he's showing you, know, look, he can fight with him. It's just the little things that are making Shabley win each round. He's getting the better of Bobby King. But Bobby King is still in this fight. In fact, Shabley told us when it came to the top 10 of the division, he had a message, stop running, accept those fights with me, or, or just move out of my way. If I was in his division, I would definitely avoid him. <laughs> Well, King uh, trying to avoid the attack from top position. Shabli, a hand-to-hand -hand combat master of sports and combat sambo master of sports. Sambo, of course, huge in Russia.
show, a guy by the name of Fedor. Pretty good at that sport as well, John. Been a world champion a couple of times. And Shabli, you talk about your fight IQ. Hey, this guy's got a bachelor degree in law. He wants to lay down the law in the cage on Bobby King tonight. Bobby, Bobby King doing a, a very nice job of continuing to try to attack Shavli. Shavli hasn't been able to launch much from this top position as far as taking the fight to the ground. Not a whole lot of damage, not a whole lot of strikes being thrown by Shavli because really he's just controlling. So right now, Bobby King's in a position where you know, he's trying to go for submissions. You see him turning here, changing that angle, looking for something to happen. It's just he can't catch Shavli out of position. And it's been seven years since Bobby Shavli secured a submission. But Bobby, or make that Alexander Shavli boy. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby King, Shavley. yes. <laughs> and Bobby King. Alexander Shavli does most of his work. You the fans don't appreciate me butchering the name. You hear that, John? I don't think that is really good. This. <laughs> they want to see more out of Alexander Shabby. They want to see him working for the finish and working as hard as what Bobby King is trying to do in getting something done against the guy who's dominated him in the fight. <laughs> King did score a armbar submission victory over Steven Seiler back in February of this year. Nice pass to half guard by Shavli. Bobby King able to put him right back in the guard. Shabley needs to really posture up and just start to land some big shots. Don't go after that little shoe shine stuff. Start landing the heaviest shots you can land. And for the sixth time in seven preliminary fights, we are going to the judges' scorecards. We'll make it the judges work. Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, go again to your king side judges. For all three, Pete Rogers, Dave Pimani, Dave Hagen, scoring the same 30. The 27th for the winner by unanimous decision, Alexander Shabley. Alexander Shabley now 2-0 in Bellator MMA. Let's go to Amanda Guerra. Moro, thank you. Well, we are just minutes away from kicking off the main card on Showtime, headlined by one of the fights of the year, Kyoji Horiguchi, back in the Bellator cage to take back what he gave up, the Bantamweight belt. Sergio Pettis says, it may be mine right now, but I am babysitting it until I can beat Horiguchi. We'll see you in just moments on Showtime. Let's get down to business.
It's an international collision course. I'm going hard. Bellator champion Sergio Pettis defends his strength. Sergio Pettis! Against Japanese superstar Kyoji Typhoon Horiguchi. Horiguchi offensive strikes! In a battle that will take the world by storm. I'm back in my lane. I'm going hard. Bellator MMA Live tonight on Showtime, where warriors rule. On December 3rd, Bellator will close out the year with a bang. This fight is done. All I kept thinking about was kill this motherfucker, kill him. And it happened. Sergio the Phenom Pettis is on the hunt for his first career title defense. Having knocked off the defending champion Juan Archuleta, Pettis has now set his sights on his next test, proving that he is the very best in the world. I also like to uh, call out Horiguchi. Um, I would love to represent Bellator versus Risen. A veteran in the sport, Pettis' meteoric rise to the top has turned him into the division's public enemy number one. A natural born competitor, Pettis' fight anyone, anywhere attitude has him defending his title against one of the most dynamic bantamweights in the world. Former Bellator.